This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. And we are back with another episode. Artofdarkpod.com at Art of Dark Pod. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> New core episodes. Yes. Yeah. In yeah. Yeah. Three in days. 48 hours pretty much here. So uh yeah. Um uh want to shout out quick to um Patreon folks for uh chipping us some money. Hopefully you are enjoying your bonus after dark episodes that we do every single episode, including uh we'll be doing one after this episode. You can find that at patreon.com slash art of dark pod. Uh, today we are joined by friend of the show um, who folks who've been listening along with us are going to know him well. Um, the great Aldous Asterion mastermind behind the forest of symbols podcast. Uh, Aldous, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Super excited to, to be back. I, I really enjoy doing the show. It's, yeah, it's great. Yeah, man, it's great having you on. I mean, you were when you came on and uh, did the James Joyce episode with us. That was, uh, I think, fairly early in our attempts to do these like collaborative mm. episodes. And I, people really seem to like that episode. So this is this is gonna. I, I think this is gonna go really well. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I don't ever feel prepared for doing these. It's just like <laughs> you start getting into them, and it's like you cannot untangle everything. It's like how are you gonna pack it even even into as long a show as you guys do, mm-hmm. uh, which like I don't know if anybody does it better in just trying to be comprehensive in like one episode, but it just seems like a gargantuan task. So, but you guys are doing a great job. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's part of the pro- That's part of the issue. It's like you start pulling one thread, and it's like the whole universe comes with it. It's like where do you stop? And this- more than one in this case. Yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> that's what I was gonna say. Yeah. This is a hotly anticipated episode. Yeah. This yeah. I think sits next to Lovecraft in terms of nerd culture and internet yes. culture, as I guess a very uh, anticipated little subject. And I think we're going to live with this fellow for a long time, the way that we're going to live with HP. And uh, of course, this is a core episode, which means Brad uh, and and our friend Aldous have done a deep dive into the subject that we're doing. I kind of hate that phrase, a deep dive. They've done a lot of research into this subject. We've got to come up with a new term for that, Kevin. We're right. Yeah, yeah. They, they they did a deep dive into dick here, uh, <laughs> into, but I'll let you, I'll let you, yeah, go ahead. I've just spent two months on amphetamines, so yeah, just yeah, kind of coming down from that. Ready to go, man. <laughs> ready to go. But I just want to be clear. There are, for Art of Darkness, there's, there are core episodes. Then there are darkroom episodes where we have people on who want to talk about a subject that we covered during a core episode. This is a core episode. This is the heart of the show. This is the heart of what we do. This is what Brad and I uh, envisioned during the the height of the plague, the height of the lockdowns. I don't know that we ever thought that we would have guests on to help us with the core episodes, but it's turned into a real thing. And uh, Aldis, just yeah. let me lead by saying thank you for coming on. Thank you yes. for doing the prep. It It really adds a lot of color and depth to the episodes to have a third person come on who shares our interest in the subject, our passion in the subject. So we're really grateful you, yes. you came on. Yeah, well, you're welcome. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. All right, Brad, right. take it away. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in case you haven't picked it up yet, we are talking about the great Philip Kindred Dick. So. Uh, before we do anything, I want to uh, I want to throw the I Ching or the I Ching because this is something that was really important to Philip K. Dick for a long period of his life. I'm not super familiar with it. Um, I, I do I'm more on the tarot side of things, but the, you can just do it online. Like you can do everything online. So I have my little um, it's called ifate.com. Um, and what should we ask this thing? I, something about this episode, I think. 
It's definitely something about the episode. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get personal hmm. here, but why don't we, why don't we ask it? Do androids dream of electric? Sheep? Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. You can hear me. Ty- you can hear me typing. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Okay. Uh, I am going to virtually throw the coins. Okay. So I have to do it six times, and then it gives me a, for folks who know anything about, about it, my first throw is the Young Yin line. My second was the Young Yin line. My third was the Young Yang line. My fourth is the Old Yang line. I don't know what any of these mean, by the way. Uh, the fifth is the Young Yang line. And the sixth is the young yin line. Okay, so now these create a hexagram. So you get, there's only a couple <laughs> options for each one. Yeah. Grubhub has your order on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Sweet. So, uh, so the, the order of how you get these old uh, young yang and young yin lines, they give a, there's a, a established reading for these. And that, each thing apparently goes back like, thousands of years i've heard it's some of the oldest writing extant writing is actually uh eaching hexagrams i don't know if that's true but it's, it's certainly very very old um so our answer uh, we got the influence hexagram um and this is the, the little write-up on ifate.com about it we are all interconnected and we all affect each other's lives this hex- hexagram symbolizes the power each of us has to support one another change and charm one another This is a time to cooperate and connect. The deeper and broader meaning of relationships comes into play as one explores the way that friends and lovers change each other. This will be a time uh, when you easily bring someone new into your life. You can understand your lover, partner, coworker by studying them and their movements, win their approval with your loyalty and steadfast vision. I don't know that we answered (laughs) our question, to be honest. (laughs) I think the answer was yes. That's yeah, a very okay. clear yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. Yeah. This is sort of some sort of like newfangled Voight Kampf test. It's the beginning of Blade Runner. <laughs> My eyes are going to start to twitch. Right, right, right. <laughs> Friends, lovers. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so, so we'll, get it, we'll get into it now. Just, I just kind of wanted to do that and see if anything cool came up. I think that's I think that's brilliant. Great. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. I used to throw the I Ching in university. Oh, okay. And my attitude toward it is it's a meditation. It's just like the, it's similar to the tarot. There's a book that doesn't have any bad advice in it, really. Mm-hmm. And you sit, you move your hands, you, you activate both hemispheres of your brain because you're doing something physical and kind of fidgety. And mm-hmm. you open up a book, again, that doesn't have any bad advice in it. Right. So what's what's not to like yeah uh yeah you just want to make sure you get a really solid translation of the the book itself yeah i do Uh, have the book around here somewhere you know one of those things i was always going to dig into never kind of got around to it so um so yeah so i think that was kind of interesting way to way to do it so let me let me start with the bio um well, no, don't we? Uh, we always start. We always start with a oh, question yeah. on the core doing? episodes, and we always yeah. close with a question. You're yeah. right, Kevin. I got confused because we already asked a question to the I Ching. Kevin, what do you know about Philip K. Dick? What do I know about Philip K. Dick? Let me think. I probably know more about him than I do many of our other subjects when we when we kick off and begin. Uh, obviously, he wrote the short story that Blade Runner is based off. Uh, my favorite piece of PKD material is not actually even from, uh, PKD himself. It's the R. Crumb comic about his, I guess, living in both realities at once, living in ancient Rome yep. and modern LA at the same time. Was it LA at the time? I believe it was. Oh, uh, California. I, yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Uh, cause I know he was living in San Francisco, but then he ended up moving to LA, uh, I read Radio Free Albemuth, uh, his insight into the idea that it's really that the Soviet Union and the United States are kind of just the same, it's the same empire, uh, I thought was really, really brilliant. And I, I tend to, I'm inclined to agree uh, with that assessment, especially after the, the past couple of years. Um, what else? I mean, he had that that weird. He had a lot of weird stuff happen to him. He was very, he's very uh, psychedelic. I know uh, Linkletter did um, that movie. The I can't remember the name of the Scanner movie. Darkly. Scanner Darkly. A Scanner yeah. Darkly. Yeah, but 
biographically, I don't know much more than that. So I feel like we're going to, this is a situation where I may feel like I know the guy better than I do. So I'm really excited uh, for what, you, you know, you're going to, you're going to take us through. I'm really excited to get the bio. And I'm also very curious what you're going to do for the after dark episode for the Patreon subscribers. Uh, if you, do you have an idea what you're going to do? What's the yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, People who are deep on Philip K. Dick lore are going to be somewhat familiar with this already. Um, after the events described in that great Arkham comic, which is uh, generally are referred to in Philip Dick lore as 2374, that's what he referred to it as, is sort of a moment, uh, and we'll talk about it in depth, but it was a moment of something between psychosis and pure religious vision. Somewhere in there is what something, ha- something happened to him. Um, and following that, he spent most of the, the bulk of his writing energy for the rest of his life trying to figure that out, working on something that would later be called the exegesis. Um, so we're going to talk more in depth about the exegesis and some of the, some of the Philip K. Dick's efforts to sort of figure out what actually happened to him, which is a really pretty interesting process. So we're going well, we're gonna to talk about it a little bit in the main episode, but we're going to laser focus on it. Uh, Aldous has got some stuff from that he wants. He's going to read and, and and so forth. So yeah. we'll do an exegesis of the exegesis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is kind of what the exegesis already was. So that's kind of uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> ah, infinite regression. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so I'll get into the about Kevin. That's all pretty much spot on. Um, Philip K. Dick you know, became one of the most respected and remains one of the most well-respected science fiction writers, um, you know, critically and commercially, I would say. Um, Wrote at least 44 novels, well over 100 short stories, um, had no fewer than a dozen films and two television series adapted from his work. I don't know that if this is true, but it feels true to me. I think he might have been the second most adapted writer behind Stephen King in terms of film and television. Uh, that could, maybe that's not true, but I think at least for like people like us, you know, born in the latter half of of the 20th century in America, it certainly feels that way. Um, he's everywhere. Blade Runner, Minority Report. A lot of these films aren't particularly good, to be honest. Uh, (laughs) it's the same, it's the same with Stephen King though. Well, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But with some exceptions, I mean, Scanner Darkly, I think is great. Uh, Blade Runner is is you know all-time great film all-time great film top, uh, top 50 great film of all time yeah, easily easily that link later movie of scanner i think does the best job at capturing the tone of what a philip k dick yes. novel feels like yes exactly <laughs> i totally agree with that yeah blade runner blade- as a film is beautiful but it's not quite the book right yeah there's kind yeah. of like an oppressive atmosphere to it which is sort of there emotionally a little bit but it's uh it, it's its own thing mm-hmm. really yeah absolutely um, so get into the bio a little bit and we'll, we're going to talk, we're going to talk more in depth on each of those books. Um, and more because there's 44 novels, Kevin, and we're going to talk about each one in depth. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just, uh, pitch a tent here. Right. Uh, we'll yeah, post up. That'll be all right. Hey, again, uh, you know, Aldis, uh, Aldis sent me some amphetamines in the mail. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're good. Um, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Yeah, I don't want our Fed to to start to come knocking. I feel like we should start to get a little bit paranoid in the spirit of this show. Oh, yeah, right? oh, black yeah. van Absolutely. is parked outside, listening. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so Philip K. Dick, born December sixteenth, nineteen twenty eight, Chicago, to Dorothy Kindred and Joseph Edgar Dick. Um, he worked for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Dorothy, you didn't do really anything when, when Philip was born she was, you know, a housewife, 1928, Chicago housewife. She would later <laughs> was, go on to get work. That was a little bit dismissive there, bro. Sorry. I think you, Sorry. I think you've internalized the oppression of our masters there. She was a mother yes, and no, uh, you're a right. housewife. You're right. you're right. Well, this is the thing. Philip didn't like her. And so I kind of ah. didn't like her. And oh, so I, I was see. being unfa- I was not being charitable. Um, Philip had a twin sister. Uh, named Jane Charlotte. Uh, both of the children were born, they were both born early. Um, uh, I believe six months, or sorry, six weeks to two months premature they were born. Um, so 1928, this is a pretty serious issue. Um, they were both sickly. Um, 
it's not clear whether it seems like either Dorothy wasn't producing enough milk to feed the both of them, or they weren't doing the the child the babies weren't eating, um, so, or some some combination of the two of those things, um, and uh, well, mm -hmm. they managed to recover. Okay, okay. Um, and then Philip K. Dick went on to live. A completely normal life, uh, but worked at a record store, uh, which he eventually bought, and was happily married to uh, Cleo Apostolides um, in Point Reyes Station. But that's not right at all, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna. I gotta find where my actual notes are on Philip K. Dick. That's not his life, and that's what it says here. I don't know if somebody has messed with my records. They've possibly broken into my files. Um, stolen my bank <laughs> records and implanted a false memory of who Phil K. Dick was here. So while I figure that out, Aldous, could you tell us about a couple of these Philip K. Dick stories that we are sort of emblematic of what PKD is all about? Yeah, totally. Um, I think short stories are a good place to start with him because um, they kind of get you the the idea um, in a concentrated form. You'll notice that um, probably more of the movies that have been adapted come from the short stories. And that's because uh, he was actually very good at writing very tightly plotted short stories. Um, the novels can be very, very kind of uh, sort of ramshackle in a way that they have all these threads and they're very strange because he piles on, on you know, all these unusual elements that maybe something that would drive, you know, one element that would drive an entire novel with another writer, he'll take, a half a dozen of those and throw them together. But anyway, um, maybe we'll go with, uh, we can remember it for you wholesale, which uh, some people may know from uh, its adaptation as the movie Total Recall. Uh, now, this, this is, is a, a banger, good which is a good, yeah. a good adaptation. Yeah. It's, it's a good example of the difference between the, a PKD uh, character and a movie character, because you know, they always take his characters and they, they, they cast Arnold Schwarzenegger or Tom Cruise in it. Whereas your typical PKD character is this kind of sad sack guy with unfulfilled dreams, afraid he's going to lose his job, not two nickels to rub together, and is totally henpecked by his wife. Okay, that's, that's, your, that's your standard PKD protagonist. And so no, no different in, in this story. Um, you have a guy who is just sort of sick at heart because he has always wanted to go to Mars. Uh, now, there's some in some versions of the PKD world, Mars is actually a miserable gulag of a place. But in this version, Mars is uh, the place you want to escape to. You know, um, it's the place where all the you know stars hang out. I don't know, but um, every other person is a descendant of Elon Musk. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're intermarrying. It's starting to get very weird. Yeah. Um, but his wife is always telling him, you know, you need to just get rid of this stupid dream. You're never going to make it there. You can't afford it. You wouldn't be able to hack it on Mars. And um, he decides to take desperate measures and go to a company called Recall Incorporated, uh, which what they will do for you is if you have something that you want to do, instead of you know taking the time to you know save up money or to train or whatever it requires, what they're going to do is they're going to give you memories. So now that you have done it, Right, so you have these false memories, which not only will they'll do some sort of brain brainwashing, so that you you have some false memories that you remember doing this thing, uh, but they're actually going to go to your house and like plant artifacts, which show that you have had this history that you don't actually have. Um, so he goes to Recall Incorporated, and when they go to put him under, they do the uh, you know regression, whatever it is that uh, that's involved there. His real personality comes out. And they discover that he actually, the life that he's living now is already a falsely implanted memory. That is not his real life. That is not his real life. In real life, he is, uh, it's not the CIA, but it's like the equivalent of a CIA agent where he went, he, set, he was sent on this mission to Mars to do some horrible things for the government. And they erased his memories and planted false ones already. 
-hmm. And so now he's really in trouble because they've been, they've got had like a chip in his brain or something. Actually, I think it's like an organic being. It's it's super bizarre, like a living plasma that's like monitoring his thoughts. Now they know that he knows, you know, and the cover has been blown. Um, So anyway, there's, there's some further twists down the line, which I won't reveal, but we'll just say that, uh, you know, as crazy as that setup is, you know, as far as like these implantations of layers of reality, one can go deeper with that. And that's kind of the thing with PKD is it's, it's not as simple as the red pill, blue pill setup that you get in the matrix. It's not like you get red pilled and now you're in reality and you know what it is because you can just keep going with the red pills with him, you know? Yeah. That's like, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, 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 yeah, you come, you come out, there's no, there is no ground reality or the ground reality is very tenuous once you think you've got to it, right? Yeah, that's yes. a, bit of that, a bit more of an inception than a uh, matrix situation. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, I would that's, say that's true. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um, uh, I'll give you another example. And this kind of gets to, uh, so we have like the layers of reality um, and the way that they're constantly falling apart. Um, another question, because famously, you know, the questions that are, are thematically uh, run through his work are what is reality and what is human? Um, as far as that theme, you know, people probably are familiar with Blade Runner and the Voight comp test. And like I said, we'll get into that one later, but an an early short story that I really love that kind of gets to this, that's very disturbing, uh, is one called second variety. And it takes place in a future in which, uh, uh, the, the cold war has been extended out way into the future where we're fighting the Soviets, uh, Soviet Russia and, what's happened is earth has just become this totally blasted gray ashy landscape. And there's just this handful of human soldiers that are fighting each other, but the war has sort of been outsourced to uh, machines and we have a world of real AI. And what's going on is where it started out as they devised these machines that were very like, they're called, they call them claws, which actually makes me wonder if this story wasn't influenced by T.S. Eliot, because there's a lot of wasteland imagery. And then you have the, the claws, which is a, something out of uh, the proof rock poem. But anyway, um, the, the machines have started to generate their own iterations of, you know, the new line, the new updated version. They're doing it by themselves and they're carrying on the war the way they want to. And the versions that they're coming out with are imitations of human soldiers or different types of humans. And the, the real humans that are there are trying to, uh, essentially negotiate a peace to the war. They're trying to end the war, but they have to get around the machines first. So they have to figure out, they know from like shooting down a couple of these things, they've found a a first variety and they found a third variety. So they know there's a second variety out there. They just don't know what it is. And they also know that it's going to be an imitation of a human, which makes it very, very difficult to negotiate a peace with the other humans. So now you start to get into that kind of paranoid mindset, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I know one of the three of us is going to be second variety. We're going to have to suss out who it is by the end of the show and kill them. Yeah. So, right. That's kind of like, well, he, that's a theme he hits. That's I, I'm not familiar with that story. That's a theme he hits also within uh, kill, kill the others, kill all others, which was part of the electric dreams television mm. or, you know, prime streaming video series. And yeah, that is something that he sort of had, um, which I think is best exemplified. Some of this stuff, I, I, I'm not sure. Philip K. Dick actually did invent some science fiction tropes, right? And we'll get into those later. But it, this one about suspicion, I don't think he invented the idea of suspecting the true identity of other people. But he definitely was kind of a master at presenting it. Of like, that, that paranoia goes like down into almost yourself, right? Like, I'm not no, sure that's... I can trust me. Yes. So so that's true. Um, This actually was a common Cold War era trope. You might know, um, like it's kind of reminiscent of the movie, The Thing, which was based on a originally of a a story called Who Goes There, which comes from this period. And so he was picking up on that. But he what he does is he develops this to an uncanny level that I don't think anybody else quite hit quite hits, you know. And uh, yeah. 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 So that's, that's the part that's kind of interesting. It's, it's the idea is you turn the paranoia on yourself and then it's like, um, and we're going to get to some instances of this actually in his life. I think it's going to be interesting. So 
Um, to get back into the bio, kind of my ham-fisted attempt to kind of throw us off, I wanted to get us a little bit suspicious about what the true Philip K. Dick reality is, because as you read about him and you get information from Philip K. Dick, he was one of these characters who not only did he not entirely trust reality, the stability of reality, he would tell different versions of what happened and why all of the time. So if you focus on a specific aspect of his biography and you ask him what the deal is with it, depending on the day and who you are, he's going to tell you a different reason. So almost all of this biography, there are some facts that I think we can rely on, but a lot of this stuff is sort of, well, that's what Philip said. And, but then he also said something entirely different to somebody else. So we're going to do our best to try and, you know, tell a narrative about him. But there's always, almost always an asterisk about all of these things. And sometimes he lied to aggrandize himself. Sometimes he lied to kind of hide aspects of himself. Um, it's a whole mixed bag with him. Um, honesty was not really his specialty. But you can imagine a guy who wrote 44 novels, one of the most adapted science fiction writers of all time, he's not going to let anything get in the way of a good story. I don't think so. Right. Yeah. So, um, so a lot of the stuff I said was true. 1928, December 16th, Chicago, born a twin. However, what happens with he and his sister, Jane, um, they're premature. They are either not eating or there's not enough food for them. Dorothy Phillips, mother, um, I don't want to say she was purposely negligent. I want to say that she was inexperienced and didn't know how to get help. Um, she sort of didn't, I don't think she knew how to address this issue that she was dealing with in terms of the, the kids not eating enough. Philip's father, Joseph Edgar, was no help either um, as far as the, from all the biographical material. Um, Dorothy's mother, Philip's grandmother, who he called Mima, she shows up to help out, uh, and she's even overwhelmed. You know, I don't know, some combination of, you know, it's twins, uh, this phenomenon that people are familiar with, momnesia. I don't know if you, you, got, you two have probably heard this term recently, uh, um, uh, where, where, where grandmothers kind of forget some of the basics somehow. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's forgetting, it's probably just pure repression. It's, it such a, it's such a demanding and difficult thing to do. And also, yeah. and I mean no disrespect, but there's something called, I call it mom brain, yeah. uh, where there's lack of sleep. The focus is entirely on the child or the children. Mm -hmm. And as the, as the father, you find yourself having to say something sometimes three, four, five times before yeah. it really sinks in yeah. because you're dealing with somebody who's chronically exhausted uh, and who just simply is, is entirely focused on this being that will die right. unless, yeah. Yeah. unless, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's something, and we don't need to get into it, but I think there's something to be said that the kind of the father's role at that time is to take care of the mom and, you know, a little bit at, at least. And, and, and Philip's father wasn't doing that. So it's, it's, it's the whole thing is, is a mess. They're fairly young. Um, at one point, um, Jane, the, the twin sister, her leg gets severely burned by a hot water bottle. Um, and then at some point, a met, like uh, Dorothy hears about an insurance salesman in the neighborhood who's been selling insurance for babies. And they, ha they have him come over. And I think the implication is that they, the kids were doing so poorly that they were going to take out life insurance policies on them. Now, part of the deal of getting a life insurance policy is a nurse would come by the nurse comes by with a doctor. Both the nurse and the doctor are so freaked out by the conditions of Philip K. Dick and Jane that they say, you have to go to the hospital right now. On the way to the hospital, Philip's twin sister at six weeks of age dies on the way to the hospital. Oh, no. Um, Philip, the only reason that Philip survives is the hospital that they went to um, was one of the only facilities in the country, or, or shouldn't say the only, it was the most advanced premature baby facility in the country. It had the fir like the f one of the first models of the modern incubation setup, or, or, or a more modern one. I'm sure it's advanced since then. And that incubation setup was run by the guy who invented it. So he literally lands in the best place on planet Earth 
to land if you're a premature baby. And this is what man, this is how he manages to get through, right? This is how Philip K. Dick survives. Um, but I mean, the death of his sister haunts him. Tessa Dick, uh, Philip K. Dick's fifth wife, would say that his mother told Philip, Dorothy told Philip much too young, when he was much too young, that he had a twin sister that died, he, that she should have waited until he was a little bit older and could maybe wrap his head around it a little bit better. That is so <laughs> tragic. And Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we just did our toe, mm-hmm. and our toe was three of nine children who survived. And right. I'm also reminded of Dali, where the parent, we'll do Dali eventually, but mm-hmm. where the parents had a child, had a boy before Dali, named Salvador, uh, who died before Salv- before Dali himself was born. And they had a picture of the, the little boy, the other Salvador, over their bed. Right. And Salvador, the, the child has no way to, am I dead? <laughs> like, right. he, it was very confusing for Salvador. But to this, the, the, you know, this seems to be something that happens to artists. You have this really essential trauma uh, in, in early childhood. Not universally, but wow, that, that's uh, really tragic. Oh, you know, yeah. it happens. And Philip K. Dick alternated throughout his life, alternated between blaming Dorothy, his mother, and blaming himself, this sort of like, well, I drank all the milk and there was none left for Jane, kind of survivor's guilt kind of thing, right? And, 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 and when you have a, something that you're guilty about that's from that early in your life, you're not it's very difficult to unpack it from yourself. You know, it's very difficult to detach and say, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. I was a baby. You know, it's, it's so deep in you. Um, so he struggled with that forever. This is another instance where we, we kind of only have Dick's version of it to go on, but the way he told it, it was basically like his mother was basically directly telling him this was your fault. Yes. You, you know, she may not have said that in so many words, but that he, that is kind of the impression that he got from her. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, whether or not she actually said that, or that was a little bit of Philip K. Dick, you know, Philip K. He had a little bit of a flair for the dramatic. And so he, you know, he, he, he wanted to make, Oh, that would make him seem like the most downtrodden he could be. Right. Uh, but it might have been, I mean, she wasn't, um, from various letters and things, she was maybe not an easy person to get along with. Um, and so it's it's possible that she, you know, and she was also young too when she had him. So I, I think it's very possible that she might have said that kind of thing. Um, uh, so the, one of the problems or, you know, one of the outfalls of this thing, this Jane, death of Jane, I, and I think it's a direct result, is that um, when Philip K. Dick is still a boy, his parents divorce um, and they live, you know, for a long period of time, they live entirely apart. Um, Joseph Edgar Dick um, would make attempts to be a father to Philip. Um, according to the biography, one of the main books I'm, I'm working from here is uh, what is generally thought to be the authoritative uh, biography by Lord Sutton called Divine Invasions. Um, and in Divine Invasions, the, it seems like he kind of states that Dorothy was trying to keep Philip away from his father. Um, and at one point, she says in a letter that a psychiatrist for Philip told her to, to just pretend that Philip's father didn't exist. Um, and I don't think that was very good for him either, if that's actually what happened. Um, now, there's a little thing here that I, a kind of an observation I made that I want to kind of mention, and we'll, 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 then we're going to get into talking a little bit about the literature a little bit more, but it's just trying to set up the Philip K. Dick groundwork. Um, so I remember listening to this thing not too long ago from uh, Dr. Gabor Mate. Kevin, I don't know, do you know that name, Gabor Mate? First, I've heard that name. Okay. Well, so that's quite a funky name. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I believe he's Hungarian, um, hmm. or he's okay. from Hungary, Hungary, but now he's, he's based in Canada. He's a guy who treated a lot of addiction um, and, and really kind of changed how, how addiction is thought of to a certain extent. But one thing he talks about a lot is the impact that stress in the mother can have on children, like wh- during pregnancy and that sort of thing can have on children. And he says that one of the primary um, results that it can have, a high degree of stress, and there are biochemical reasons for this, is uh, it can have cause the children to have asthma. Um, 
asthma being, you know, they cure asthma with steroids, basically, not cure it, but you, you treat it temporarily for in the moment with steroids, right? And he has this whole theory that he seems pretty confident in that a lot of cases of stressful mother to creates this like corticosteroid adrenaline dependency in the child, which leads to asthma. Well, Philip K. Dick had asthma. Now, is this, is this because his mother was stressed? I don't know, but I thought this was an interesting connection. And why him having asthma is important is they put him on amphetamines when he was six years old. And he would be on amphetamines for the majority of his life. It started Ooh, with... Doggy. It started, Whoa, it started with asthma treatment and, you know, we're going to get into how deep the amphetamines got and it got, we're talking, I don't know who did more Johnny Cash or Philip K. Dick, but <laughs> they, <laughs> you, you know, you guys, uh, usually your motto is don't do heroin folks. Yeah, uh, yeah. At, by the end of this, you, you should probably add amphetamines to that. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, it's gets scary. And we're going to also talk about how that may or may not have played into the 2374 stuff and all of that. So. This is an alchemy happening of how to create an artist like PKD. None of this is a surprise if you know any of his work. And yet you go, what were you, what were you thinking? But I guess we do this for, to kids now, right? Don't oh, yeah. we? I mean, what is Adderall? Adderall yeah. is meth, isn't it? It's, it's an amphetamine. I don't know the, yeah. the, the exact distinction, but it's basically an amphetamine. It's habit forming, certainly. And it has much of the same uh, effect that it, uh, as as amphetamines do. So, I, you know, I think there I, are, are amphetamines. I cannot take Adderall. If I take Adderall, I don't remember what happens. Oh, it's really? Bad. Oh, oh yeah. Really? I I go to rock and roll shows and don't remember how I ended up outside. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> I, yeah, it's not good. I can't do it. I, I got to say, I have taken Adderall or Ritalin a couple of times, and I'm scared of it because, for me, it's awesome like you know what i mean it's like <laughs> brad becomes like, he becomes too productive it's, un, it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> and so i i like yeah. a handful of times and then like i was like that's not that's too good like that works too well for me that's uh, a, that would be a problem so right just push that away i yep. can see where that goes Yep. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I got a diagnosis of asthma and they, uh, they gave me primatine, which is, uh, which is actually, it's over the counter, but it's, uh, it's usually under lock and key because mm. it, it is a precursor to methamphetamine. This is something that oh, people really? will buy if they're cooking up meth. Uh, um, not that I, oh, yeah. well, we're, we're going to just spread that information out on your <laughs> show. Right. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> um, people who want to find out can find out. Yeah. But it is a danger, like the same medication. That it's just the stuff that opens up those bronchial passageways. It's in the speed category, so right, you right. got to be careful with that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think I do think Philip having as Philip having his amphetamine treatments very young. I, I mean, it has to be a, a factor, right? So it's just a smooth transition from asthma medication when he was a kid, right on into you know all kinds of all manner of uppers um throughout you know almost throughout his life um but let's transition and talk about uh uh i don't know i'll just what book you want to talk about next maybe we'll start getting into some of the some of the literature a little bit sure yeah um so the 50s books um i haven't read as many of those um his books are always weird um but it you might be surprised if you're um, coming to him, to those from the later uh, books, that it, it actually takes a while for him to get that unique kind of Phil Dickian kind of uh, unique feel. I think one of the earliest novels that really that, that does this is uh, one called Eye in the Sky, uh, because it, it gets to this theme that will become really important of the subjective reality, this idea that everyone that people are capable of living in a reality that is completely populated by their own internal uh, uh, logic and imaginings. Um, and what sets this up is there's a, there's a machine called a Bevatron. I don't know what it is. It's like a particle accelerator type of thing. And something goes wrong with that. And what ends up happening is uh, this group of characters uh, gets plunged successively into different worlds, each of which is completely colored and dominated by one of the individual's 
making up the group. Um, so you have, you know, there's like a woman who's a, a prudish woman, right? So when they get projected into her world, nobody has genitalia. <laughs> just for instance, right? That's awesome. Um, yeah. You know, there's a, the titular eye in the sky comes from uh, uh, one of the characters who's kind of a religious nut. And up above them throughout the entire time is this eye that is watching them, this, you know, surveillant, you know, tyrannical god constantly, uh, who's called Tetragrammaton. Um, and so that also kind of shows his, uh, even though I think the religious themes that came to obsess him uh don't really show up as much in this first decade of his fiction, but you can see that he does have an interest um, early on with uh, with some religious ideas. There's actually another book um, called Cosmic Puppets that has to do with a, a war going on this town uh, over this like small town, and and it's actually two gods that are fighting, which is uh, uh, the two gods from Zoroastrianism, uh, Ahura ah. Mazda and Angur Mainu. Um, but anyway, Eye in the Sky is, uh, it, it's pretty fun. I, I wouldn't put it, you know, near the top of his books in terms of quality, but it, it gives him an opportunity that that kind of setup gives an opportunity to play around with all these different worlds. Right. Um, and so it's, that, that one's pretty fun. Yeah. 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 There's definitely a, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but there's definitely like, he started in the pulps. I mean, talking like we did our love episode of Lovecraft. He started in the you're getting paid X cents per word and you just got to crank this out. And it did, I think, take him some time before he kind of grew into the idea of, hey, I'm writing a novel. I can take my time with this a little bit. I can get weird, you know, I, not just weird with it, but I, I can do something with a little more thinking a little bit more carefully than just speed freaking through it. And it did take him a while to get there. Yeah, well... Uh... Well, I, mean, I know we'll get into this more later, but one of the things that was going on at this time, and I think Eye in the Sky is like 1955, just to kind of yeah, set, set us up here, yeah. um, is he's actually like early on doing two completely separate tracks in terms of his writing. Right? He's yeah. writing the science fiction basically to get paid. It's yeah. not that he doesn't like it. He actually he loves science fiction, but he also has this ambition to be a, a respected literary writer. And so he's at the same time, writing these completely realistic literary novels that he has hopes will be, you know, his actual like fame, you know, his, right. his uh, he's going to make his career that way eventually. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and, and yeah, that's an interesting that, and we'll, we'll probably touch on that a few times here as we go. Um, uh, talking kind of back in the, the bio. So we kind of talked about his childhood. Um, I, I want to talk about some of the other kind of issues that he had that started manifesting in childhood, but in adolescence, you know, as he's becoming a young man, um, he did not like to eat in public, which is, uh, and this would be like, this actually lasted a while into sort of into his 20s. I think he claimed that this had something to do with his, um, at, at various points, he claimed it had something to do with his throat chakra at one point, I believe, but, but he also is, is attributed this to the fact that he felt this guilt about eating Jane's food, so he sort of didn't want people to see him eating. Um, I, you know, he's not the only person who, to have that experience. Um, but it wasn't just eating. He also had trouble swallowing, which led a psychiatrist to claim that he may have been molested as a boy, but Philip doesn't rem didn't remember that. Um, and, and I think from a couple instances, we've mentioned a psychiatrist already. I think we can see like, he was not well served by psychiatry. And this isn't necessarily a criticism of psychiatry, but in Philip K. Dick's life, it I don't know how much it helped. <laughs> um, and this is one, and one instance of it is, okay, yeah, his, a psychiatrist telling his mother to keep him away from his father and pretend his father doesn't exist. Later on in life, he'll get some very, and we're going to talk about this, he will get some very, very bad relationship advice and assistance from a psychiatrist. Um, the only one, well, well, we will get to that later in his life. There is one sort of psychiatric part of his life that may have been helpful, but um, it's sort of paradoxically helpful and it almost shouldn't have been, but it was, uh, um, he had, so here are some other things that he, he, it, let's just, I'm just going to give you almost like a bullet point list of Philip K. Dick's issues. Okay. <laughs> and these kind of wax and wane throughout his life. Um, but most of them are at least on the table by the time he's, you know, 16, 17, 18. Um, he could be agoraphobic. 
uh, he had unstable attachments and did not like to be alone, except when he was writing in which he demanded to be alone, um, which is hard to deal with, right? He fell in love with almost every woman he ever met. Uh, he could be extremely needy. He did have a temper at times. Uh, part of that could have been coming down from speed. You know, if you're on speed your whole life, a lot of your personality isn't, it's not easy to distinguish what's symptom or what's uh, side effects and what's your personality, right? Um, coming down from something like Adderall or uh, Coke, I've heard, yeah, can probably. really, uh, you feel like the end of a rope, like a frayed edge of a rope that's been burned. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a metaphor for it. You just feel completely because you're, you're not sleeping. You're, you're having way too many thoughts, but yeah. you don't necessarily remember what just happened. People who get addicted to this stuff uh, want to avoid that feeling. It's similar to uh, an alcoholic who uh, the only cure uh, for a heavy drinker is another drink or to white knuckle it and get through it. Or they can give you something like Ativan or whatever. And, but right. I mean, you know, now then you're into like medical right. territory. So the, you know, the, I think the amphetamine, it's like, you don't want to feel the, the horror, uh, you know, that you're going to feel when you come down off it, especially if you're taking more than you should be. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Chasing yeah. that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's so, and yeah, so for somebody who's on it for decades and decades, it's like you get these things where I'm like, well, he was probably on speed when that happened or he was out coming off of speed, you know, or whatever, or it's very, <laughs> it's, it's, and, and, and we're going to talk about it even more. It's a lot of speed. Like it's an incredible amount. Um, okay. So, uh, he had a temper. He was a bit of a hy hypochondriac. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, he was, I think basically, a pathological liar. Um, uh, and part of that came from the fact that his grasp on reality itself was fairly tenuous. Um, he would be variously diagnosed throughout his life as both perfectly sane and as a schizophrenic. Um, physically, he had par paroxysmal tachycardia, severe asthma, bouts of vertigo, and there was some suggestion that he might have had a learning disability. Um, <laughs> what, what you're saying is that he's basically killing it at Art of Darkness bingo right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's lining up. All the <laughs> he's things. hitting all the buttons. <laughs> this really is two in a row where we're do dealing with a lifelong addict. Arto was a lifelong yeah, addict, but on the other end of the, the spectrum in terms of opium. Yeah, uh, yeah. Different yeah, vibe. Think, yeah, very different, very different vibe. Um, so anyway, off to college. Philip K. Dick tries to go to um, University of California, Berkeley. Um, so he's born in 1928. This would have been, he, he didn't do it right after high school. So this would have been like 1948. Um, you know, it's before, it's before Berkeley is what we think of as Berkeley now, but it also was getting to be the Berkeley that we think of as Berkeley now. So, so it was, you know, hippies weren't quite a thing yet in 1948, but if there was a proto-hippie, they were probably going to Berkeley. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not sure exactly what the history of why Berkeley is Berkeley. Uh, it'd be interesting to know, but... Um, if you were in Berkeley at that time, you were basically like way ahead of the curve in terms of the counterculture. So much of this yeah. stuff comes out of uh, San Francisco and that kind of that oh, yeah. area in California. So, I mean, he was essentially like a quasi-beat for a while he was yeah. he would live yeah, beats he would live. to hippies yeah 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 and he was highly influenced by all those people and i mean he's he's basically the same generation he's the same generation i mean kerouac is born in 22 he's born in 28 um so uh and, and doing he, the right drugs for it too i think <laughs> yeah well they were all yeah they were all on speed yeah kerouac and philip k dick uh could have uh it, they could have dipped into each other's drug bags and known what they were looking for that's for sure um now philip k dick again He's a fabulous. So you hear various different stories. You hear that he quit because he was disinterested. Um, the story that he liked to tell was that ROTC, he had to do mandatory ROTC training. Um, I read in something that that wasn't even true, that there was ROTC man was mandatory. So I'm not sure. I mean, it was 1948. It's just after World War II. I guess I could see it being mandatory. Philip K. Dick claimed that he was so bad at ROTC that they kicked him out. Like he literally, he couldn't, he couldn't assemble a gun. He couldn't show up in the right uniform. And he would claim that there was in fact like a, 
subconscious force that was making him screw up basically. And that, you know, okay, this thing doesn't want me to do this. So it's making me screw up and then I'm going to get kicked out. Um, Philip K. Dick's good friend, uh, I believe his name is Xander Gray, just said, no, he had a nervous breakdown and he quit. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> so I don't know which one's, which one's more interesting. I, I mean, maybe both of them, maybe there's some truth to both of them. But he would, you know, he would often flippantly say, like, yeah, they kicked me out. Um, and, you know, how true that is, uh, I'll leave for the listener to decide. Uh, this, this force uh, wanted me to run up all of my credit cards and land me in bankruptcy court. <laughs> Right, right. I, it's not, it's not my fault. Yeah, it's it not my fault. energetic force. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and, it, yeah. and there's a lot of that in Philip K. Dick territory. Like, honestly, like, there's a lot of stuff that goes bad and it's sort of like, yeah, why did, yeah, like, there's a lot of, like, you remember in uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas where they're driving across and the salt shaker full of cocaine gets blown by the wind. And they're like, did you see what God just did to us? <laughs> did you see what God just did to us, man? There's a bit yeah, of that. Right. You, 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 and then he's like, oh, you're, you're, what are you, a DEA agent? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lo- that's a very Phil K. Dickian moment, that whole scenario. Um, <laughs> um, uh. So... So whatever, it doesn't go to college. It's 1948. You don't got to go to college, right? So he, he um, starts working at a, at a, for a guy who owns both a record shop and a stereo TV repair shop. Um, and he actually quite likes this, particularly working in the record store. Philip K. Dick was big into classical music, um, you know, even more so than his peers. Um, he does talk a bit about being sort of alienated by his peers because he's like, he lives in Berkeley and a lot of his friends are sort of stereotypical typical Berkeley people, poets. He knew he was friends and actually lived with a number of people who were openly homosexual, which in 1948, you know, it's pretty unusual for people to be open about it. Um, But he knew the poet Robert Duncan. He did. Yeah. So I was going to mention that. Yeah. Who's, who's, you know, a pretty major figure in, in American, in American poetry. So yeah. And they were friends when they were kids, you know? So, um, so he's very close to that scene, that whole, like he could have been a beatnik, I suppose, if he would have sort of zigged instead, instead of zagging. Um, but, you know, he's very interested in sci-fi, which those people didn't really read. But then he was working with like these TV repairmen and kind of more blue collar guys who they didn't read at all. So he didn't really fit into either of these scenes. And he was always, he, he always... And I, this is something else I think he played up. He was always sort of the alienated kind of outcast figure, but it seemed like he always had plenty of friends around. So I, I'm not sure how true that stuff is. Maybe that is how it felt to him was that he was alienated. Um, you know, we, we talk about uh, like nerd culture now, but I would say it's, a, it's actually hard for us to understand because in a way that's like become the mainstream culture. Yeah. Like all the biggest movies are science fictional movies, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you consider superheroes to be, part of sci-fi in a way they yeah. are. Um, yeah. But I think it's hard to understand at this point in time in the 1940s and 50s, even though this is like the golden age of science fiction, right? But it's extremely niche. Like it has no connection to other literary scenes. Uh, it has no connection to the mainstream of culture. I mean, you would get later like the B movies that are at drive-ins and stuff like that. And that would expose people to it. But in terms of l- the fiction, yeah. It was a small world. Everybody knew each other. It was just a, it was like this handful of people who were doing this and who were very interested in it. So yeah, yeah that's, that's there's that's a really direct true. line uh, from Lovecraft to here too. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah older, the pulps. Yeah, 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 yeah. The pulps. Mm-hmm. PK, PKD is obviously younger than him, but he I'm sure was in magazines that Lovecraft was either in or would have been in if he'd lived longer, for sure. Yeah, it was definitely the same territory. And probably Frank Herbert, too. Like, if you were to go back and look, you know, story to story, I'm sure you you might even find one where they were both in it uh, at the same time. Because there weren't that many. There were a lot, but, yeah, you know, it's still a limited world. And, and Philip K. Dick was a little bit, you know, we mentioned the fact that he really wanted to be a mainstream writer. He was a little bit alienated within the science fiction community because he liked classical music. He liked Proust. He liked Flaubert. Uh, Flaubert. Like, those are some of his favorite writers. He, he liked there. Finnegan's Wake of all he things. Did. He did like Finnegan's Wake. Yeah, yeah, he did. And so he was, so, you know, you go to a lot of the other science fiction writers and for all their talent, especially in the pulp era, they weren't people that were coming out of 
they weren't people who were coming out of the humanities departments of major universities. You know, they weren't people who'd read, oh, they'd read everything and listened to everything and they decided they were going to write science fiction. It just wasn't, I mean, it's still to a degree, isn't that crowd. So, um, so I think he did feel a little sense of alienation because, you know, he starts meeting other famous science fiction writers and they haven't read Finnegan's Wake. They haven't read Flaubert, you know? Um, so it feels a little, feels a little strange. Um, there is, I want to get, talk about some more specific works of his, um, but I do want to put a, something that happened when he was fairly young that I think tells us a little bit what his, his life is like romantically. So one thing, his twin sister died. He's constantly looking for her. And it's very complicated and Freudian, I think. He's, he's always looking for her and other women, um, but, but then he's sort of wanting to marry them. And I think he's got... I think there's some confusion, you know, subconsciously for him. He often felt like he was talking to his sister. He often felt like he knew what her personality was like. Um, the women that were his type is also how he described his twin sister if she lived to an adulthood. So there's something very, you can't call it incestuous exactly because she's not even a person. She's not even a living person. It's, it's, it's deeper than that in some way. Um, he does get. Yeah, go ahead. It is worth noting that uh, one of his novels, "Flow My Tears," policeman said, features um, a police chief who is having an incestuous relationship with his twin sister. So, oh, yeah. or I actually don't know yeah. if she's a twin, but it is his it's sister. His sister, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I bet later on, as time went on, he probably. I mean, maybe this isn't something he would say in a letter or to a person, but he probably did start to feel like there was something a miss there in this sort of attraction he had or I see again, I don't even know if you can call it attraction because she's not, she doesn't exist. She's almost like an imaginary friend that yeah. is, is both his sister and his lover kind of thing. It's very, very strange. There, there is also the, uh, there's a certain female character that crops up again and again in his books. That's a, a woman that's basically on a collision course with death and then the male character in the book will be trying to save her in some way. And this never really works out. So, you know, in whatever form it takes, you can definitely see that he's trying to work out this psychological damage. It's, it's almost hard to overrate this incident in his life and yeah. his work. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's every, it's everywhere it's at every level. Um, in the late forties, um, he does get married, uh, Mo he, and moves away from Dorothy. He's 19 years old. You know, this is even before he went to college. This woman is named Jeanette. She's apparently in her late 20s. Apparently, right after they got married, she told Philip that she was free to see other men. Um, she's a bit of a slob, which, you know, whatever. Um, he's 19, and he marries a woman in her late 20s? Yeah, she's like 27, 28, 29, uh, something like that. Um, and they, they got divorced like a couple of months later. He, he just he did not know what he was getting into. And I think he was one of these guys who like, he just wanted to get married. Like as soon as he met somebody and he kind of liked them, he was like, well, I should just get married to them. And you know, that's the one I really, it, it actually never worked out. Uh, this, uh, Philip K. Dick's mommy issues.com. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. They're definitely there. Um, so, okay. Maybe now it's time to talk about another, uh, another Philip K. Dick book. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about Time Out of Joint because I think it's uh, kind of the culmination of his 50s uh, work. It comes out in 59. I think it's, the, I think it's a breakthrough for him um, in terms of actually, because he had played around with a bunch of different kinds of ideas. And of course, he would continue to do that. But I think he hits on one in this book that like became his signature thing, which is this reality breakdown um, scenario. And um, it's what you get is a kind of like in the beginning is kind of like this pristine, you know, 1950s uh, reality of suburban mowed lawns and nice houses and everything. Um, and it features, uh, it, th th this book has been compared to uh, the Truman show for a, a little bit of a reference. And I see the comparison. It makes sense. Although it doesn't really give you, there's also that special Philip K. Dick weirdness to it that it doesn't quite capture the, the lead character, for instance, is named Raggle gum. Um, <laughs> just one of many, many weird PKD names like that yeah. uh, crops up and Raggle gum, like 
does not have an ordinary job. He makes his money, uh, and I think he's like living with his sister or or his brother in law or something like that. Um, and he's making his money by entering this contest in the newspaper called "Where Would the Little Green Man Be Next?" And apparently, he's like the Ken Jennings of this game. He he gets it all of the time, and so he lives off like his prize money for this. And but as you're sort of getting introduced to his world, some odd things keep happening that make you think that there's eh, something not right about this world. Um, there's kind of this, uh, I believe this is a, an actual scene in, in the book where he goes to reach for a, a light switch and it's not there. It's like on the other wall. And he's like, I know that it was on that wall. This is the kind of thing that this has probably happened to you, something like that, you know? Um, actually, I think they, this is a Mandela effect, right? It's not what they, yeah. they, call, yeah. they call it now. Yeah. This little little thing where you you go, I know I've, I've flicked that light switch a million times and it was over there, oh, yeah. right? So normal person goes, okay, I remembered wrong. Philip K. Dick goes, oh no, there's a completely different explanation for this, right? <laughs> complete your reality has been completely rearranged right so what eventually happens uh there's a really really cool scene in the book where he goes to a soft drink stand to buy a soda and suddenly the world just blinks out of existence and he's fine he finds himself standing there holding a piece of paper that says soft drink stand <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah. So I, I won't elaborate where this goes, but you can see that the world that he's living in is not what it's cracked up to be. And uh, it's, it's there for him in a particular way. Uh, he's a sort of special person and he doesn't quite know yet why or what it is. Another interesting thing that I'll just kind of drop in there because I'm a big Thomas Pynchon fan mm -hmm. and Pynchon and Dick actually share a lot of themes, a lot of the paranoia, um, you know, uh, they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways. Um, and, I could be wrong, but the, the reason that Raggle Gum is in this particular world, the way, what the, the idea that's kind of driving uh, Time Out of Joint was picked up by Thomas Pynchon and used for Gravity's Rainbow in a, like, a really brilliant way. So it's a little influence there that people mm -hmm. might, might not be aware of. So mm -hmm. I know that Pynchon was a, a PKD reader as well. So Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raggle Gum sounds like a lost White Stripes album. It does. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does. That's very good. <laughs> Raggle gum. Yeah. I, get to, I can see it. It's like, yeah. yeah. I love that. It feels right. It, it uh, just feels right. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of stuff in there, like where Philip K. Dick uses names or calls things stuff, and they're like a little, they're a little cheesy or a little like uh, hokey kind of, I guess. Yes. It's the same thing. But yeah, it's, it's pretty common for him to. Yeah, he calls somebody something, you're like, really? That's the name that we're going to stick with this whole book. The next 250 pages, that's what we're going to Okay, all right, I guess I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, he tried to go to college. He tried to get married. None of those things worked, right? But there is a sort of a turn happening soon for Philip K. Dick. He meets this woman who, in my opinion, is probably just the woman that he should have stayed with. Um, it's wife number two of five. Um, her name is Cleo. I'm not going to mispronounce this. It's a very Greek name. Cleo Apostolides. It's close enough, I think. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a rare, infrequently used, like, uh, grammatical tool. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it does. It's yeah, like, you got to get a couple of possible of these, yeah, right? or like a rhetorical yeah. figure. Yeah, right, exactly. right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Yep. <laughs> this will be on the quiz, right? <laughs> uh, they would. Uh, so they get married June of 1950. Philip K. Dick is uh, 21 years old. They live together actually for eight years. This is probably, I would, I'm going to say this is the happiest period of Philip K. Dick's life. Actually, he may. Maybe didn't think it was particularly happy at the time, but I think, you know, just on paper, at least, it seems to be the, the happiest um, period. Um, she was, you know, she's into opera, which Philip K. Dick was also into. She was dark haired, which is critically important for Philip K. Dick. Uh, she was curious and intellectual, unpretentious. Um, and, you know, just in many ways, like just a really good match for him. Uh, they got a house. 
Uh, PKD was actually able to charm her parents, despite the fact that he had basically no prospects whatsoever. He just worked at this record store. Um, this is apparently something about Philip. Oh, yeah, he was a, he was a high energy guy. Gives yeah, you a yeah, lot yeah. of attention. Right, yeah, he's right. got yeah, probably a bit of a chatterbox. I, oh, I wonder, was oh, he a talker? Yeah, okay. he was. Now, this is the thing. He would vacillate between extreme introversion, like, and, you know, crashing from speed, frankly, and, <laughs> and being very chatty. But he was also a guy who was very interested in things and I think was probably very good at retaining information. So, like, he was probably, he was, uh, and a lot of people say this, he was just a great conversationalist. He was just a really cool guy to talk to because he always knew something about something and he was always able to make like lateral connections between things, you know, and it's just interesting. Yeah. All of his um, uh, interviews that are available on YouTube are worth listening to in my experience. Yeah. He's a great interview subject. He really, he really is. Well, yeah. It says his paternal grandparents were Irish. So he had they the were. gift of gab. He, he had the, the uh, uh, Irish... Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Irishman ah, on speed. It's almost <laughs> terrifying to contemplate. <laughs> right, right. That's hmm. Okay. <laughs> um so anyway, so he's married to this Pleo, right? And she's actually super supportive. She's like pushing him to be a writer. She thinks he's got real talent um and and is willing to and willing to facilitate this to the degree that she can. Um, you know, and, and they're still young. They don't have any kids. They've got two incomes. Neither of them is making a ton of money, but they're doing just fine. Um, uh, and in 1951, Philip K. Dick sells his first story. And this is a story called Rogue. R-O-O-G. Um, it's kind of silly, honestly, but I think you actually do see like a primary Philip K. Dick theme. Um, it's about a dog who, quote unquote, realizes that the garbage men are actually aliens come to steal, coming to steal the food. And so the dog tries to alert the humans by saying, you know, Rug, Rug, because the aliens, according to the dog, are called Rug. That's basically the whole story. Okay, so it's kind of silly. I, don't, I didn't read it. I'm not going to imagine it's fantastic. Philip K. Dick didn't think it was any good. Um, but I do think it does suggest this thing um, that's really important to Philip K. Dick and it's a sort of key Phil Dickian motif along with what is a human and what is real, which is reality, or maybe it's a sub, it's a sub motif under what is reality. Reality is a projection to him, Phil. I think he was suspicious all the time that the world in front of his eyes was being, was, was actually constructed by his own psyche and brain, which is true to an extent, right? I think you can argue about the, the limits of that, but is fundamentally something that is the case, right? You know, you, you don't see things, you see what your optic nerve and brain have interpreted the light hitting your eyeballs as, right? So, um, and it's right there in basically his first extant story. Well, he's also really interested in animals too, and mm -hmm. the, the, the empathy with uh, animals uh, it becomes a big deal in uh, like uh, do androids dream of electric sheep, for instance. So yeah, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge aspect of that. Yeah, he well, definitely the, was a. Question. These are all fundamentally sound philosophical realities. I mean, this mm. is true. Right. Nobody wants to live the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Right. But it's some there. people do, and they're correct. Uh, <laughs> again, I, I keep going back to Artaud, but. It's mm -hmm. this thing where, okay, you're, you're having intimations of apocalypse in 1937. You are correct. You're, you, it doesn't help you function or move through the world, but you're right. not wrong. Right. Uh, and, and so I think it's a similar thing with PKD. And, yes. and this is a, a thing you realize, of course, through the, the doing this show and, and hopefully listening to this show, artofdarkpod.com, uh, that artists are like this nerve ending and if you're only five years ahead of the curve, you're going to seem like an alien. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially now, especially in, like in modernity and into post-modernity, because things are moving so fast. Mm -hmm. If somebody five years ago had told us what would have happened in the, in the um, subsequent years, yeah. you would have thought they were completely crazy. And yeah. yet here we are. Uh, yeah. And so PKD is this man out of time. I mean, Nietzsche even talked about it. The... Um, I, I can't remember the German phrase, but the untimely man. 
uh, yeah. the untimely person. I think Arto was that. I think PKD was that. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, uh, not to get us too, uh, you know, sidetracked or anything, but uh, the we are used to kind of calling like certain science fiction writers or works prophetic, and that's because they seem they predict certain technologies or they predict, you know, something that a kind of government that might come about or something like that. But with Philip K. Dick, because a lot of his stuff still, still seems weird and outlandish, right? That's kind of part of the appeal. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, and you know, so it's hard to say that he literally predicted anything. Um, but there's something about the, the, the pervasive sense of, of the world not being real. Uh, that is, it almost seems like he, he experienced our reality ahead of the fact, because this couldn't possibly be more timely. Right. right. Everybody knows that nothing is real online or at least is very uh, suspect. Right. Yeah. But increasingly it's bleeding into the real world and everything is a LARP or it's yeah. performative or mm-hmm. it's a false flag or it's a deep fake. Mm-hmm. Um, we just can't know. And that, that, that particular feeling that he got across in, in so many of his books of uh, this, you know, on, so what uh, the critic Umberto Rossi calls ontological uncertainty is, which is what pervades his books. And that's something that even normies are feeling right now. I oh, think. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're hitting it. I mean, I think, you know, between the information siloing algorithms and yeah, the deliberate psyop attempts and the, you know, we're living in where it does seem like we're gradually living in, you know, whole realities independent of each other. <laughs> for mm-hmm. sure. Yes, you yeah. get the uh, subjective, you know, projection of realities as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I talk to, I'm, I'm extremely, I mean, we say in the front of our show that we're two very online writers. I'm very online. I talk to friends of mine who aren't online and I do live in a different reality than them. Like, yeah. full, full stop. They don't, and it's not that I'm right and they're wrong or anything like that. It's just, I live in a different reality than they do. Well, and I also yeah. noticed that the dialect really picked up uh, during lockdown. I remember uh, there's a pal I made over here in the neighborhood who saw, I, cause I'm doxxed. I don't care. I'm, I'm, out, I'm a face cuck. Uh, <laughs> he saw that I posted a lake that we live near and he emailed me kind of on the, on the DL and was like, ah, oh, you know, on the bird website. And we sort of felt each other out and we became pals and and we we started talking, and all the the, the vernacular started coming out, right? Face cuck, red pill, uh, bap, whatever else, you know, all these like little inside things that you only know if you inhabit a, co- a certain corner of Twitter. Uh, and we were just, he was just like cracking up at the beginning. He's like, it's so weird to hear somebody like <laughs> say <laughs> these things aloud. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. You speak yeah. very online. Yeah, right, it's a thing. right. It is a dial. It is a dialect. It's not that different from everyday English, but it is certainly a dialect. I now fully understand. Maybe it's not a dialect, but it's its own vernacular for sure. Uh-huh. I uh, I fully understand how Burgess would get the language for A Clockwork Orange now. I can mm-hmm. I can construct entire paragraphs that normies wouldn't be able to grok. Uh, oh, yeah. Just if I wanted to write a paragraph about the past year in crypto and what it's, what it's been like to be on crypto Twitter... I could write a paragraph that would just be gibberish to mm. somebody who's not that way. It's kind of wonderful. <laughs> oh, I, it's part my, of the fun. One of my favorite things is coming across a tweet that is very clearly articulates like an event or something, but none of it would make sense five years ago at all, <laughs> including the meaning of some of the words. None of it makes any sense at all. I, uh, I love, it's like a crystallized, like that's a time capsule. Like that is this moment right now. A good example uh, is this recent conflagration around Mulbugs, uh, Hobbits, and Elves, mm. and all of the tweeting that went on around that. And I think somebody who's not with it, not following along with that particular corner of Twitter, goes, why are all these accounts talking about Hobbits and Elves all of a sudden? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and what does this mean? And of course, I mean, I, there was even a tweet recently where I read it and somebody was making a point about the Hobbits and Elves things. And I, I replied, I hate that I understand what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Someone named Moldbog, who's also yeah. named well, Darwin. He writes Tolkien fanfic. Is that, is that <laughs> what <laughs> Sort of. All right. <laughs> it's hilarious. 
<laughs> yeah. So Philip, I think you're right. I, I think you're right that Philip K. Dick is sort of he's not identifying the details of this, but is sort of identifying something about what that feels like. Certainly, that that sort of disintegration of reality and the, and, and the ground kind of coming out, uh, coming apart under your feet. Um, uh, you know, just kind of talking about Cleo a little bit more. Um, so there is a point in the 50s um, where he, okay, so he gets that first book published. And I actually want to just kind of hit, because I want to, I got to give the audience a sense of the fevered pace of Philip K. Dick writing in the 50s. When he was on, this is what it was like to be Philip K. Dick as a writer. So 1951, he gets uh, that, that story, um, Rug published. Um, 1952, four of his stories, both fantasy and he would write fantasy early on, fantasy and science fiction um, would appear published. In 1953, there were 30 stories. <laughs> there were 30 stories published. In 1954, 28 stories. Um, and that's a lot. As somebody who's incredible. written short stories, it's incredible. 30 short stories, 30, that's more than two a month. Um, that's hard to do. And, and these aren't, they're not incredibly polished, perhaps, but they are generally fully fleshed out, fairly original conceptually, if not in terms of plot or character, right? These are, um, this is on par with Rod Serling writing, you know, 60 episodes of Twilight Zone in a year or whatever it was, right? Um, it's definitely in that camp. And he managed to do this. He hit this at the exact right time. So I want to give you a little tiny sense of what the pulp industry was like. So. Um, 1940, from 1946 to 1953, so bridging into Philip K. Dick's actual writing career, the number of pulp, pulp ma uh, magazines, places where Philip K. Dick could be published, went from 8 to 27, right? And Philip K. Dick would basically end up appearing in all of them. <laughs> and uh, this, short, this run of short stories, dozens and dozens and dozens of short stories over a matter of years, he would, um, in 1955, um, a British pub publisher would pick him up to do a uh, hardcover, excuse me, hardcover collection of his short stories called A Handful of Darkness. And in 1957, um, there, there would be another, uh, pub another uh, uh, collection of short stories published. A handful, of, a handful of Darkness. That's a very cool title. Yeah. It is a cool title. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, like I like it. the word. I like the word darkness. I like things with the word darkness in them. Me too. I don't, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to think of anything else. I'm <laughs> trying to think of anything else that might. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool title. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to quick point out two other short stories. I'm not going to go into them in the detail that Aldous has gone into, in, into, into some of these, but just if people are wanting to look at these, here's some more. Uh, Electric Ant is super interesting. Comes a little bit later, but I think it's one of his better short stories. It's about a, a, a guy who realizes he's an android um, through some means, but it actually opens himself up and it's very strange. Like it's, it's, there's like, there, there's like a much more mechanical aspect to it than a computer aspect to it. And he actually like, he, he figures out that he can manipulate some part of it, uh, of the machinery that makes up his own cognizance of the world. And he will like slow it down or speed it up or sort of like put his finger on part of it. So it doesn't happen. And that's the reality generating part of his you know his android brain and he literally like stuff literally disappears for him so again it's about it's mixing this projection thing with the android thing reality yeah. what is reality what is human as i recall it's like a tape that yeah. has like uh kind of like punched out parts of it right, that's um, right and so what he decides to do is he's just if what if i just punched out like all of it i just like there's like a section of tape where i just cut out everything that's right what, that's what right. would happen um it's kind of interesting i just could this just kind of occurred to me is that like because of that pattern you're you're obviously dealing with like a binary situation you either have the tape or the punched out part of the tape right mm -hmm. so what is the what is the I Ching made out of mm -hmm. it's yeah. you have the line or you have the broken line right yeah. and it's it's another like binary system and of course we we create computer languages out of a basic binary system i too right. ones and zeros right right um, it's, a, it's a very 60s short story too it's like what if we started tinkering with our basic with our like our cognitive circuitry so right 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 yeah yeah i love i love that story the the other good short story is the imposter which kind of plays on some of these same themes but, but the big part of it is um, and just to give you the like the two sentence what the gist of it is there's 
uh, a, a person who is basically an android who is also like a world destroying weapon and the trigger word for this weapon I'm just going to spoil it the trigger word for this weapon is basically the moment that he realizes he's an android and says there's a key word he says but as soon as he realizes that he blows up the entire world uh, which is yeah. pretty good <laughs> well somewhere I think it was in an interview he said something like or maybe this was in one of the books I, I can't remember uh, of the of the you know hundred books of Philip K. Dick that there is to read. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's hard to remember where things come from, but uh, sure. he said something like, I, "I believe that there is like a phrase that would, if spoken, for every person would destroy them." Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I'm I'm sorry, your order has been delayed. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, I just slid no. down my chair. <laughs> uh, the so the imposter. Oh, the imposter, we have fun. Oh, it's this is great. I'm having a blast. The imposter plays also on now. Philip K. Dick. I don't consider him to be. I don't. The Cold War was an influence on him, as it was an influence on on everybody. I think that paranoia of that. Um, is is not his paranoia is almost deeper than that but it does kind of play out in that realm sometimes now he was very later on very paranoid about the cia the fbi etc cetera, etc cetera. but let me tell you this let me read this thing from the soot and bio this is when he's married to cleo um this is before anybody knows who he is other than he's published a few short stories you know he's not he's not philip k dick he's a dude who published some short stories in some pulp magazines right so, um, nonetheless, <clears throat> one day in 1950, and this is from the Sutton biograph biography, nonetheless, one day in 1953 or 1954, FBI agents George Smith and George Scruggs knocked on the door. This is the door of, door of Philip K. Dick and Cleo. They were dressed, Cleo recalls, in gray suits and Stetson hats, Stetson hats, like nothing in our world, our world being the Berkeley world of like hippies and artists and poets and communists, you know, um, Politely, they asked the couple to identify faces in Sather, Sathergate surveillance photographs. Sathergate was where all the political rabble-rousing happened in the Berkeley area at that time. Cleo pointed out some obvious Berkeley political luminaries and then herself. Then Phil, Philip K. Dick and Cleo asked questions of their own, fascinated by the agent's knowledge of splinter parties. There were more visits. Cleo describes Phil and herself as, quote, nervous, not threatened. They were obviously just fishing. Scruggs became friendly and took Phil for driving lessons one day, says Cleo. We, we would have socialized with Scruggs, but he was quite a bit older. Really, they could see that uh, we were just a couple of dips and, didn't, uh, and they didn't want much to do with us. But there was something the agents wanted. They offered Phil and Cleo the opportunity to study at the University of Mexico, all expenses paid, if they would spy upon student activists there. Phil and Cleo found the offer attractive, except for the spying, and refused. The vis visits petered out after that. So he's 24, 25 years old, and the FBI comes on his door and is literally trying to make a deal with him to go spy on people. You know, I remember when I was at the University of Minnesota, which is sort of spook central in its own way, and people mm -hmm. forget that Minneapolis has a Federal Reserve branch here. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens up in this region uh, beyond what makes the headlines. And yeah. I remember when 9-11 happened, uh, the word went around the campus that the CIA and other groups of that nature were reaching out and meeting with uh, all the Arabic students uh, uh, the students who were studying, you know, Middle Eastern studies and this and that, uh, and word went around. So we think this is something from the distant past and it couldn't happen now. Right, right, right. right about yeah. it. Yeah. It ha yeah, probably exactly. happens more now. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. 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 Well, you know, I was interested. I, at 9-11 was uh, my freshman year of college and um, went to a school downtown, basically downtown of a major U.S. city. And immediately there were like FBI agents on the buildings and there were bomb threats. And it was sort of like never talked about after that, but it was like, it was just very odd that like all of a sudden there were a bunch of bomb threats at that school. And maybe it was just kids pulling pranks. I don't know, but it's just a very strange vibe. It was sort of like, you wonder how many of these little stories there were about that. Were day. the bomb threats enough to kind of get 
things cleared out. Oh, they sent everybody home. Well, that could be what it is, is they just, because they, that could be part of their drill. How are we going to get people out of here? That's the story you tell. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? And I don't have enough to say, to even speculate about what was going on there. All I know is that like the FBI was all over the place very quickly. Your paranoia is wholly justified (laughs) every circumstance, (laughs) (laughs) especially if you live in, in the United States of of America. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, let's take a minute here and uh, I'll just, what's another Philip K. Dick book we can talk about? Um, Well, we could, uh, do you want to talk about uh, one of the, the realistic novels? Yeah, Yeah, Um, let's let's do that. Yeah. Get kind of a flavor of it. It's, uh, I've actually only read one of them. Um, I might get around to reading some others, but uh, at this point, uh, I think all of the ones where we have a complete draft of them have been published. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's like something like nine of them. uh, Although there may be 11, maybe more because there's some where we have titles and that may be a lost manuscript or maybe just something he intended to write and didn't wind up doing it. But uh, it just kind of goes to show you with all that you you were talking about how much he published in the fifties and like, seriously, go look up the PKD bibliography and just look at the 50s and look at the list of the stories along with the novels published. And then at, on the side, he's writing these realistic novels that he's hoping will be will break, break him into the serious literary world. Um, and these novels tend to be a little bit longer than the other ones because he's going after that modernist, you know, Proustian thing. Um, I've read most of these. I did recently read uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's book on Philip K. Dick, uh, which surveys all of his novels. And he says that basically they're the realistic novels. It's kind of like Dick doesn't know what to leave out. Like he doesn't get a handle on, on how to, and you know, one thing about trying about like writing in a genre like science fiction and selling your fiction is you'll get a good idea of what to leave out. Right. Cause it's mm-hmm. plot driven, idea driven fiction. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, the one that I've read is actually the only one that got published during his lifetime, which is called Confessions of a Crap Artist. And uh, it only got published in the 1970s. He wrote it in like 1960 or 1959, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so he basically failed to, like he wrote a, a minimum of nine novels that he failed to sell. Like just imagine, like... Uh, pretty pretty dis- discouraging um and, and and you know there's debate about the quality of these books um you know it may you never know with the taste of publishers you know and like at that time it was even more closed world probably you know like it's just hard to break through sometimes uh with your fiction but um i i would say like i i enjoyed confessions of a crap artist but i would not put it you know, I would not rank it among my favorite of his books, but there's some interesting things about it. It's, it's basically like the tale of a kind of, of a fairly miserable domestic setup, which I gather most of his, his um, <laughs> straight fiction books were. Yeah. Um, it's basically a married couple that are just in the worst marriage possible. And they're the, the crap artist of the title is the, the brother of the, the woman of the wife in the book. Um, and he is, I don't know if you could probably technically say autistic, but he's something. Um, and, you know, PKD has a real strong interest in what we would now call neurodivergence. Uh, it kind of makes me wonder about him, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the character is named Jack Isidore, which is a name that he would repurpose for a character um, from, in Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you've huh. seen Blade Runner, it's the guy who is the toy maker, lives alone and with all the like little automata and things like that. Who's, the, who's kind of a crap artist in the Blade exactly. Runner world. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but in but in the book, he doesn't make stuff like that. He he works as a like a tire regroover, which I'm not sure is a real job. I think PKD <laughs> might have made made it up. Like it's like you take old tires and you add grooves to make them look new again. Yeah. It's very very Philip K. Dick, but. Um, yeah. And so he's a crap artist because he's like obsessed with a panoply of, of like weird and useless ideas, I guess. Um, a lot of it would be, I, I would categorize as Fortean phenomena, you know, paranormal things and like, uh, things like that. Um, and I, re- I actually think this character is, is Dick's own commentary on his 
activities as a science fiction writer. Yeah. Um, so the novel is, uh, it is kind of modernist in technique where you get alternating chapters from the perspectives of, of the, of, of Isidore and then the, the husband and then the wife, um, they live out on a farm in rural California. Um, he gets involved in, uh, it's also like kind of looking forward to the new age movement too, because he gets involved in like a UFO cult that's, that's, that's kind of gathering out there. So it's a realistic novel. There still are these like odd little sci-fi type details. And I actually think that he's working, he's at his best when he's like mixing in stuff like that. Um, although I think he was just really ambivalent about his status as a science fiction writer. I just, I think that's what he was best at doing. Um, later, I think he would be more successful at applying the skills that he used in writing these realistic literary novels and, and, and blending that with the science fiction. Um, yeah, like I said, this this novel wasn't published until the 70s, and that was at the due to the work of a friend of his named Paul Williams, um, who started the the magazine Crawdaddy, if anyone knows that. Uh, it's like an early like uh rock and roll criticism journal. Um so uh Yeah, and Paul Williams is the guy who wrote the big there was a sort of a watershed moment when uh there was a Philip K. Dick profile in Rolling Stone in the mid seventies. I think Paul Williams interviewed him for that. Yeah, well that he was, wrote a whole he wrote a whole book about Dick too later. Yeah. One of and the would first become, books to be written about him. I think it would become that was his literary ex, I think that was who executed his estate mm. as well, or his yeah. literary from a literary standpoint anyway. So yeah. So no, that's that's very interesting. I actually I did like I, I didn't reread Confessions of a Crap Artist headed into this, but I read it years ago and I remember thinking it was good. I, I remember I was just reading any Philip K. Dick book I could buy at the used har- uh, used bookstore near me. And so I just got that one. And I wasn't even really reading the backs of them, you know, <laughs> it's just like, okay, this is another one. Um, so I didn't even realize, like, I didn't know any of that history of, a, you know, it's his only mainstream novel that got published. And I remember quite liking it. It was, it's sort yeah. of, it had, it had more heart than most Philip K. Dick, which makes sense. Uh, but also was unusual and kind of and 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 did have these moments where it it, it I, I think it's I would anybody who's a Philip K. Dick fan who hasn't read that I would definitely recommend reading it as like another point to triangulate and try and figure out what he was up to as a, as an artist. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it was worthy of being published at the time, but it's worth noting that after this book, he essentially gave up writing that kind of book. Mm-hmm. So, but well, of course. Yeah. Later, he would actually get really successful writing his other kind of book, sci-fi. So that might have influenced right. that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to, just to hit this point of how hard he's working, while, while he was publishing all those short stories I mentioned in the 50s, also most of these mainstream novels he wrote, um, he wrote eight of them, and he may have wrote, this may not have been all of the attempts, but he wrote eight of them between 1952 and 1958. Um, yeah. In, in while writing all of these while, while writing all of these short stories as well, so um, you know how good are they when you're cranking out eight in six years? Uh, you know I, I don't know. <laughs> I have my own opinions as a writer on that, but um, yeah. Um, at the end of that period, 1958 is I think when you can start to see PKD's life uh, falling apart to a certain extent. Um, he'd had these good times with Cleo. He was bringing in some money. Um, Cleo was probably the breadwinner at some uh, for a while. Um, Philip K. Dick did get fired from the record store, and then he would never have a normal job ever again. After I think it's 1954, um, he would never. He would never. He would be a writer. He would be a working writer for the rest of his life. Um, you know, I had my perception of him before this doing this research was that he was basically poor his entire life, never really got any recognition. Um, and that's not really true. I mean, he, he didn't have really any significant amount of money until later in his life. Um, but he was publishing stuff for money pretty much right away. Um, and that never really stopped, though there would be peaks and valleys to it. Um, but in, in 1958, um, there's, uh, Dick and Cleo, they move to this little kind of cabin in Point Reyes Station, um, and they kind of immediately, it's a little bit of a smaller community than Berkeley, and they immediately get become part of this kind of odd little community. 
Um, one aspect of it is they get invited to a meeting of this UFO cult that's in Point Ray Station, which is comes up in Confessions of a Crap Artist. Um, and, yeah, oh, we try to do my ceremonies. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and and Philip K. Dick, I, you know, I he didn't. I don't think he really glommed onto them, really. But you know, it was something that he would go investigate and see, see what yeah. they were up to. Yeah, hey, if somebody, if somebody uh, has a UFO cult going on, I'll show up to a meeting. <laughs> oh, if I move to like a new town and somebody's like, hey, come <laughs> to my meeting about UFOs. I'm like, ah, yeah, why not? Let's go check it out. You know? It's just if what they're if, serving Kool-Aid, yeah. you know, maybe don't, <laughs> right. you know, don't imbibe. Right. Right. I want to see them the open the packet. Right. Open the packet. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, one thing. One thing this UFO cult did, and this is interesting because this is not the only UFO cult to do this. They believed that in 1959 the world would end and they would be saved. The house that they lived in would be turned into a spaceship. Also, like the Heaven's Gate cult. I don't mm-hmm. know what that is. It's like an arch- a cult archetype that the aliens will save you, and you, you know, I don't. I don't know. It's just very interesting. So Philip K. Dick kind of ran into these people. Now, one of their neighbors in Point Reyes Station was this woman named Anne Rubenstein, or Rubenstein, who um, was recently widowed. Um, her husband had been an actual fairly successful poet. Um, uh, she was about Philip's age. She was smart and energetic and assertive. Uh, and she had sort of expensive tastes. And she was... Uh, she was sophisticated, and while Cleo, uh, at first, Anne would come out and hang out with Phil and Cleo, but then eventually, when Cleo was off to work, um, P, uh, PKD and Anne would hang out alone, um, which, you know, it's never a good idea when your work-from-home husband is hanging out with the attractive, widowed, neighborly lady who he seems to get along with really well. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it was only a matter of time. And PKD and Anne ended up together. Um, again, this is part of Philip's problem. He falls in love with every attractive woman he meets who gives him any attention whatsoever. So um, it, this kind of was sad to me because in the, doing the biographical research, I really liked Cleo. And actually in interviews with her later, there's a great documentary um, that was made in like the 90s where it includes interviews of people who knew Philip K. Dick personally. She's just great she's a sweetie she seems smart and fun and 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 thoughtful like she just seems like a great person and even in the divorce proceedings philip k dick treated her was a jerk to her and she still kind of came out with like well phil was phil and that's how he was and you know i hope the best for him you know (laughs) so um they did get divorced um philip k dick would claim that she didn't want to bear children uh and and uh for him though she claims that was not true um, he, he claimed that she cheated on him. That apparently was not true. Um, so he kind of piled a lot of garbage on her, um, a lot of which I think was actually his own crap. Um, and so, yeah, just not, not great. Not a great way to do things. Yeah. Um, five wives. Five wives, yes. Going for um, the old, the old Heming- Hemingway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of wives. It's a lot of wives. Again, another Art of, Art of Darkness bingo right there. It is, so, it is. Yeah. yeah, it is. Five this wives. is a fabulous idea. If anybody out there <laughs> uh, wants to create an Art of Darkness bingo card, I think yeah. that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. 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 It's gotta be, you don't have to have five. I feel like, what's the number? What's the number to make it? Four? Anything three or more yeah. wives yeah. is... Yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as soon as three, three signals mommy issues in a big way, barring yeah. barring accidents. Well, yeah, right, right. right. Widowed is different. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. If wife one fell down the stairs mysteriously, right, right. and then wife two fell down, wife the two stairs. drowned in a hot tub, right. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> it, really, it all depends but it yeah yeah depends. i think i think three or more it's sort of like yeah, yeah you enjoy yeah. marriage too much yeah five certainly five context doesn't even matter anymore well be way yeah. beyond <laughs> yeah 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 so um things as you may guess with Anne did not go all that well um uh they were very soon getting into terrible fights even violent fights um 
PKD would sometimes have these like explosive rages that he would not remember afterward. Um, and there are instances of physical violence, though. Anne would later say, kind of say, we beat each other up. Um, I don't have enough to go on about specific instances to really say a whole lot about it, but it did get physical at times. Um, Anne had uh, three. Um, sorry, Anne had three daughters, I believe. I can't. I don't know if she had two daughters or three daughters, but nonetheless, in 1960. Um, Anne would have Philip's daughter, um, whose name was Laura Archer. So this is Philip's first child. He was already playing the stepfather role, which apparently he was not very good at. Um, he was a husband for the third time, which he also apparently was not very good at. Um, and, uh, yeah, so he has this daughter, 1960, age of 32, something else happens that I think is indicative of sort of his trajectory. Um, one thing that's difficult to get our hands on now, it's not easy to tell how heavy the amphetamine usage is at this point in his life, it, leading into 1960. We can kind of take as our markers, Cleo doesn't say anything about it, but I think we can kind of take as our markers the fact that his writing was so productive. He says he was taking amphetamines, but I don't know, the volume it doesn't reach its fever pitch quite yet. However, when he's 32 years old, he's hospitalized with chest pains and diagnosed with pyloric spasms, which apparently is like a mini heart attack. So I think we can say he was doing enough speed to have a heart attack when he was in his 30s. I think that's probably fair to say. Yeesh. Oof. Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, another thing happens in 1960. Anne gets pregnant with their second child, and she has an abortion. Um, really, really, really productive. I keep writing more short stories. I keep, uh, they're <laughs> going to publish a book of my short right, stories right. and it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Yeah. Oh no. And then, oh God. And then she had an abortion. Yes. Oh no. For the second one. So they had one daughter together. Now the second, the second child they were going to have together, she already had three daughters. So I think her thing was, you know, we have too, we have, there's too many, right? Was, her, was, was he, her was he affected by that? He must've. Yeah. Been. Yeah. So, I mean, you think, you know, He'd had the thing, the issue with his twin sister, which is something that still haunted him. Um, and, you know, he he sort of went along with the abortion, but then regretted it later and kind of used it as a weapon and a, as a cudgel against Anne, which it's not really fair if you go along with it and then later use it. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, pick a pick a side on this thing. Um, uh, Anne would say, uh, Anne, this is a quote from Anne. I think the abortion may have brought back his awful birth experience with his sister Jane dying, but one of my daughters says about this, Phil takes this stand against abortion, but he didn't even want to raise his own children. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy mm. to it too, right? Sort of like he was willing to like just walk away from marriages and kids, but also, you know, so it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, he's, I, I think he would come down on, I don't know. I guess you would probably come down on the side of like the pro-life side of things now if you were around now. Well, he he wrote a notorious anti-abortion uh, story after Roe v. Right. Wade initially happened, called the Pre-Persons, where you can be aborted uh, as old as like eight years old. Uh, oh my god! You didn't become a human being until you could like understand algebra. So, <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> well, like that weird... <laughs> yeah, that I'm sure that would fly really well now. Hey, I People hate. People in his milieu, you know, the like Berkeley people hated him for this story. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. Oof. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, one thing. Okay. So one thing that happens around this time too, in the 1960s, this is where the, uh, this is where the I Ching comes into his life. Um, now I did not know this, but apparently his enthusiasm for the I Ching um, would actually lead to a broader enthusiasm about the I Ching in like the new age hippie community. Um, he definitely was like feeding into that, including uh, Terrence McKenna was kind of obsessed with the I Ching. Um, and so I think Terrence McKenna probably got it from there. Um, one thing I think was really funny is, so we're going to talk about the man in the high castle in a moment. I want to go kind of deep there. But one thing that was kind of funny about the I Ching in relation to the Man at High Castle, Philip K. Dick has a Japanese character using the I Ching. Now, 
The I Ching is a Chinese uh, phenomena. Um, and Philip K. Dick initially got some flack for like this, hey, Japanese and Chinese aren't the same thing, man. You can't just take these things and put them in, you know, he kind of got some flack for that. And maybe rightly so. But interestingly enough, Man in the High Castle became very popular in Japan. And thus, I, the I Ching became a fad in Japan. So it actually became a Japanese thing. Hyperstition. Really? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Philip K. Dick made it a Japanese thing. I yeah. just watched Spinal Tap last night and yeah. Big Bottom was fifth on the charts in Japan. It restored their <laughs> career. Big Bottom. <laughs> uh, I, gotta, I gotta get something translated into Japan. Maybe that's what I'm missing. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, like realistically, and there was this kind of like, you know, um, Eastern religions first became popular in the West, like via, or at least in this country, via exactly where he was located, Berkeley, California, that whole scene. And there may be a kind of like too easygoing syncretism with that, where you could just kind of pick and choose, you know, right. di different things, like in a kind of consumerist way where, you know, it's maybe not that authentic. But realistically, why is the I Ching and Man in the High Castle? Well, probably just because he was super into it at the time. Yeah. And he was yeah. also writing this novel. And so you just work in your, your latest obsession into your book. But I could actually make a case for a reading of Man in the High Castle in which it makes sense for Japanese people to be using the I Ching in this world because there is actually a theme of cultural appropriation in the novel. Another craze that's going on, uh, and I guess I might as well just introduce yeah. the scenario, like a lot of people probably already know this, but Man in the High Castle is set in a world in which the Axis powers won World War II. It's an alternate history book. And the Nazis and the uh, and Imperial Japan have uh, split the United States where the uh, uh, the Germans have the East Coast and the Japanese have the West Coast. There is a kind of neutral or like Wild West territory that's sort of in between um, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, particularly. Um, and uh, he has various char characters from various strata of this society. Um, the Japanese characters um, are, and, and it, most of it is, is set in his milieu in, in San Francisco, uh, which is Japanese occupied. Uh, white Americans are second class citizens in here. Um, but one of the things you see is that the uh, kind of more like um, bourgeois kind of uh, middle class uh, successful uh, Japanese characters in that world are very much into like authentic American artifacts, like from the uh, the, the Wild West and things like that. So one of the things that happen when you become like a subject culture is that you're you know, your, your, your culture, because someone else's costume or someone else's consumer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, purchases and things like that. And so, um, Japan and China being, uh, you know, actually pretty terrible, uh, rivals throughout much, much of their history. As you probably know, in World War II, there was a brutal invasion of China by Japan. Um, so it, it's realistic that when Japan became victorious in that war, they could, be adopting the I Ching as a like spoil of war, you know? Yeah. So yeah, not? not that none of this is said in the book. I'm just coming up with a plausible reading for why this is the case. <laughs> yeah. 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 But no, I think that, I think that makes sense. And that is a good point. Cause that is, that is a sort of a motif of the man in the high castle, right? It, it is. It's a, well, let's talk about that book some more because I think that there's a couple of reasons why this book is important. One is this actually launched, this is the quantum leap to say a cliche in Philip K. Dick's career from a pulp magazine writer who had written some books, some novels to a respected novelist within the science fiction community. It won the Hugo award, which is, you know, the big award that you can win in science fiction to this day. Um, and as his biographer says, you know, you know, he had some dissatisfaction about writing science fiction instead of uh, literary fiction. But if he, he now had gone, if he was in the ghetto of sci-fi, at least now he was the king, right? So, right. yeah. So, so this is he's top of the heap. He's a, he's a top. He is a top level science fiction writer now. Um, in in when the Man in the High Castle comes out. So yeah, let's kind of talk about what else what else is going on in the Man in the High Castle. One thing is he used the I Ching to write it to plot the mm -hmm. entire thing out. Apparently, every major plot decision he was throwing the I Ching and sort of doing his interpretation of what it said to do which I think is pretty interesting technique. Particularly um, when uh, 
when you read the book and the characters are always consulting Bi Ching, right? Mm -hmm. So you know when that happens, he was doing that. And so right. it had this effect of change. And so he had to interpret it as the character would interpret it. And that would change the direction of the novel. Mm -hmm. And so it gives the book this weird quality of, of being like alive, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. there's a divine kind of aspect. He's really like playing with reality in this book. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what are your expectations for a novel like this, an alternate history novel? Well, okay, I've got this book where the Nazis won World War II. What do you think is going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is you're going to look at the underground and the resistance, and you're going to have some really evil, gnarly, nasty Nazis, you know, as bad guys. This book is not really like that. I mean, there are elements of that, but he starts doing whole new things and playing with the reality. I mean, he does one is that um, he sticks a not, an alternate history within his alternate histories. Like, you know, yo dog, I heard you like alternate history. Right. So, you know, um, <laughs> right, right. Stacking them up. And the yeah. book, so the book in within the book is called the the grasshopper lies heavy, and it is, and it's a it's a book that's banned within this world, but people are all still reading it. Um, Even the Nazis are reading it, right? Isn't that yes, part that's of it? right. Yeah, everybody's yes, yeah, reading that's, it. Yeah. That's right. That's the thing is it's like this underground book that everybody is reading. Um, and it tells a story of a world in which the allied powers actually won World War II. Um, and now what you would predict is that, oh, this book tells the story of our world. But as you get the details, you find out that that actually isn't the case because it's the details are all different. Like Rexford Tugwell becomes president and the Cold War is actually between the United States and Britain. Um, it's like boom, like a wormhole into a completely different reality opens up, right? So the, um, so what I, the way I like to think of is that this book has a, has a book within the book and it has a book without the book, outside the book, which is the I Ching, which is another yeah. book, which is structuring this book. And so, you know, the man like High Castle becomes like, I, I call it like Rust, Russian nesting dolls, if the Russian nesting dolls were also like funhouse mirrors, you know? <laughs> right, they, <laughs> they were like distorting each other. other. Yeah. Level. Yeah. Um, and so what uh, the, the the man in the High Castle is Hawthorne Abinson, the book, uh, the, uh, the author of the book within the book. And there's the, uh, the trajectory of it is kind of the, the, the search to find him because he's supposed to live in this highly fortified place in the Rocky Mountains where, you know, uh, uh, America is still, you know, uh, there are still free Americans living. So, right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a great book. Actually, I think um, I would rank it, the the television series also fairly high up on the Philip K. Dick adaptation list. It's no yeah, Blade I Runner. But I didn't get a there. chance to watch that yet. Yeah. So uh, I didn't finish it, but I did watch like the first. I think almost all the first season. It's pretty good. Um, the one big difference. There's a few differences. One big difference is the Grasshopper Lies Heavy. Instead of that being this one book. Um, what is his name? Hawthorne Robinson? Hawthorne, Hawthorne Abinson. Abinson, right. Uh, he's, a, he's like a filmmaker. So the, the text, the text, the intermediary text is actually films, which makes more sense, I think, for something that you're going to be watching anyway. But it's, yeah, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good and faithful adaptation. And it is kind of a brilliant book. And you can see, too, that Philip K. Dick is, he's now, I think, reached his next, maybe his second of three levels of writerliness right of of he's now this is not a there's no this is not formulaic it's formulaic in a formula he devised perhaps but but it's it's it, there is a, a flair of there is something pinchonesque about this i think right we yeah, are getting yeah. into into this yeah so meta so postmodern mm -hmm. yeah it's an easy uh, word to throw around but i think it's true in this case yeah by the way, just real quick to plug my own podcast, Forest of yes. Symbols. I, I've decided to uh, do a little sh kind of short episode, um, kind of unraveling the the symbolism of the grasshopper inspired by this book. Because he, he pulls that out, uh, the line out of Ecclesiastes, which is, he says the grasshopper lies heavy. The more common translation is that the, the grasshopper will be a burden or something like that. And so yeah. uh, there's a question of what, what exactly that means. Right. And um, he also references uh, Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust. So he's kind of doing something with the symbolism there. So Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, I, I definitely look forward to that. Yeah, and I, I should have given you, give you more opportunity to talk about it because your podcast... I've said this many times, but I'll say it again. I love it. I anxiously await the next episode coming out. Oh, For folks who haven't heard yeah. it, I, 
and, and I, the one thing I, I love about it is for a person, because I've, I've, I've shared it with some people in my, my everyday life, some on, offline people. And I, the, the one thing, one aspect that I think is impressed them is like, it's an episode on bees. It's just called bees. And you don't realize the rabbit hole that you're going right, to go yeah. into based on the name of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like, oh, what's up, bees? All right, let's all learn about just, bees. Oh, Oprah, like, bees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah and, so. and, you know, the, the production on those episodes, uh, it's very labor intensive. And uh, I haven't gotten out very many lately, but I, I have a lot of episodes planned. So people just oh, be good. patient. I've got, I've, got, I've got big plans. For oh, good. It, so. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. You're, I, you're, podcast is the only podcast i know that takes more work than ours <laughs> yeah so um so yeah we're anxiously looking forward to that i want to read people, a- people don't know this though that going into when we go into art of darkness season three at the end of the yeah. year we're going to yeah. totally flip the script and overproduce this like an npr podcast there's going to yeah. be little like jazz flute interludes yeah. we're going to yeah. break it into different sections right, right. Uh, i'm going to really slow down yeah. i'm going to yeah. take some some edibles, probably some, yeah. some indica, and we're really going to, it's going to be the smooth jazz right. of dark artist profiles. Going yeah. I think you should I, go, you should go the other way. You should get Hans Zimmer to do the soundtrack. Zimmer, That's what yeah. I think. <laughs> John yeah. Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, we will never do that. This is always, <laughs> you know, we found the format for the show. We're going to stick to it. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I thought about the next watch party. That would be fun, Brad, the, for the movie watch party. Maybe What's we that? should watch. The Passion of Joan of Arc. That might be uh, quite a lot of that. fun. Yeah, kind that. of tagging our toe. But in any in any case, I don't yeah. want to detract. But no, yes, no, listen no. to listen to the Forest of Symbols podcast. Absolutely, you could do Absolutely. a PKD movie too, possibly. Oh yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, maybe around the holidays that'll be fun. Scanner, Blade Runner, something. Mm. Scanner's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Scanner would be Blade Runner would be the on the nose one to do. So maybe we yep. do Scanner. Right. Yeah. Right. Cool. Right. Um, I want to read this little bit from Philip K. Dick about writing. Uh, man in the high castle and i think remember that he's like a pathological liar when we reread this bit right so th- who knows what actually happened one thing that's important he's to a note fabulous here, brad he's a fabulous okay there you fair go enough. fair enough yeah. um one thing that's important to know is note is Anne. he's married to Anne now right and she has very expensive taste uh but she has started her own jewelry making business selling them on etsy i imagine and it apparently has started to do fairly well, and she's now making more money than him, and this is a problem for Philip K. Dick. So anyway, um, this is from him. He's talking about writing Man in the High Castle. I had actually decided to give up writing and was helping my wife in her jewelry business, and I wasn't happy. She was giving me all the shit part to do, and I decided to pretend I was writing a book. And I said, well, I'm writing a very important book, Anne. And to make the fabrication convincing, I actually had to start typing. And I had no notes. I had nothing in mind except for years I had wanted to write that idea about Germany and Japan actually having beaten the United States. And without any notes, I simply sat down and began to write, simply to get out of the jewelry business. And that's why the jewelry business plays such a large role in the novel. Without any notes, I had no preconception of how the book would develop, and I used the I Ching to plot the book. So it just kind of makes it seem like it's an accident, which is... I don't know. That's always funny to me. It's like, <laughs> we're going to play pretend. Um, now, there is something else that starts going on in this period after Man in a High Castle comes out, because I think this is where... So, Philip K. Dick, he's not a schizophrenic. He's not schizophrenic. He doesn't have schizophrenia, I don't think. Um, he always had a somewhat tenuous grasp on reality. When he was a teenage boy, he had this moment that he describes as the AI voice or possibly his twin sister's voice gave him the answers to a physics test that he was struggling with, right? So like, and he had moments where he, he'd had like a Satori when he was a very small child about the, the theory, understanding that this beetle was him and he was the beetle and they were both Christ together, right? He's always had this... Um, He's always been able to like see through the layers of the immediate reality, right? But this starts to ramp up, and I think it starts to get more intense because I think the amphetamine usage is getting more intense. That's my suspicion, though I don't know that he necessarily says this. He, he's, very, he's not very good at putting a pin on 
you know, in his interviews, he doesn't tell you how stoned he was when. Um, but I think as we're hitting Dan in the High Castle territory, I think we're probably leveling it up. Either that or it's really starting to affect him and play off of the, the characteristics he already had innately. Um, but let me give you a little sense of some of his paranoia because things get real paranoid with Anne and they get pretty dark pretty quick. Now, um, this is from a friend of his named Xander Guy um, talking about Phil during sort of this Anne slash Man in the High Castle time. Phil was talking stuff so outrageous it made no sense. What he was experience, experiencing, what was going down, I couldn't make sense of it. He was going through extreme vacillations between depression and almost manic things. He would say, quote, Anne hooked up the stereo to the Jaguar and dragged it down the street. It could have happened, I don't know, but that's pretty far out. He said Anne tried to kill him. I would see her, and my God, Anne's pretty mellow. She's a nice lady. Talking about her, Phil had gone from she's the greatest thing that ever happened to me to she's a pseudo-demonic creature, the destructive feminine princi uh, principle of the world. There was a general paranoid cosmology going on with Phil. Faces in the clouds, government, FBI, you name it. It was like he was holding the fort against the forces of evil. Okay, so this is his friend describing Phil. Now, something else happens here. Um, by the end of the summer, I'm reading again from the Sutton biography. By the end of the summer of 1963, Phil had decided that things with Anne had gotten totally out of hand. Dr. X, this is a psychiatrist that he'd had for a long time, and I don't know that anybody knows who it actually was. Dr. Dr. X helped him, helped him realize that his marital problems were largely due to Anne's mental condition. Again, psychiatrists are not helping Phil, okay? Uh, Dr. X's diagnosis, Anne recalls, was manic depression. Sheriff Christensen, um, Sheriff Christensen was this nearby guy who Philip actually had a writing hut on Sheriff Christensen's land called the Hovel. That's where Philip would go write every day, and Sheriff Christensen was cool with it. So Sheriff Christensen, who'd witnessed Anne an, an in a fury one time when he'd come out in a response to her call, uh, her call was not inclined to disagree with Dr. Dr. X's diagnosis. Phil told them both, that's Dr. X and the sheriff, that her spending, had gotten, her spending had gotten out of hand, that she had tried to run him down with the car and had threatened him with a knife. And so one night during dinner, Sheriff Christensen came to the door with involuntary commitment papers signed by Dr. X. While the girls watched, Anne was hauled off for 72 hours of observation at Ross Psychiatric Hospital. Okay, and then after she comes back, um, she... Uh, after she's released on the way home, Phil insisted that they pay a visit to Dr. X, who informed Anne that uh, she was a manic depressive, even though she'd been diagnosed, uh, not given that diagnosis at another, uh, another institution. Um, while in the clinic, Anne had spit out the daily Stelazine pill. Her first day in, she had swallowed it obediently and did not like how it felt. According to Anne, Dr. X now insisted that she keep taking them at home. Phil threatened to leave her if she refused. Phil's faith in Stelazine, which is a downer used to manage certain dis um, psychotic disorders, was sincere. He himself took them on occasion and found them beneficial. Anne's experience with the regular dosage was that they turned me into a zombie. Once I had taken them, I didn't have, have sense enough not to take any more. Anne stayed on Stelazine for two or three months, suffering some impairment of memory. She and Phil began seeing a female marriage counselor who made little dent in what was happening. Anne, after her Stelazine haze, was furious but still determined to save the marriage. So he, somewhere between she's perfectly fine and he's totally insane and they're both kind of crazy, somewhere in there is the truth, right? But whatever the case, it seems like Phil and this psychiatrist kind of conspired to have her committed and then Phil, like, demanded that she be doped so that she you know and you know who and sort of seems like she this was not none of this was really true that like but yeah it, it's it's very murky i guess is my, is my point um and there are shades of that thing that used to happen with with women in in the psychiatric institution was like oh your wife's a bit of a problem why don't we just lobotomize her you know, that definitely, that kind of thing definitely used to happen. So yep. who knows? I mean, maybe she was a kind of a pain in the neck sometimes. You know, I, who knows what the actual truth is. But I think it's fair to say that that marriage was not going to last forever. Um, in 1963, 
we also have what I think is Philip K. Dick, K. Dick's most significant vision not associated with the 2374 stuff. I'm going to read a little bit about this, and then we're going to talk about the book that it influenced. Um, so this is, again, from the biography, but this is going to be a Philip K. description. He's walking out to this hovel. This is his little writing shack he's built out on Sheriff Christensen's land. This is post, you know, Man in the High Castle, all of that. <clears throat> there I went one day, walking down the country road to my shack, looking forward to eight hours of writing in total isolation from all humans, and I looked up in the sky and saw a face. I didn't really see it, but the face was there, and it was not a human face. It was a vast visage of perfect evil. I realize now, and I think I dimly realized at the time, what caused me to see it, the months of isolation, of deprivation of human contact, in fact, sensory deprivation as such, but anyhow, the visage could not be denied. It was immense. It filled a quarter of the sky. It had empty slots for eyes. It was metal and cruel. And worst of all, it was God. Okay, so that's a huge influential vision for Philip K. Dick that he would be forced to somehow fit into his cosmology, right? Um, and it really influenced the book he wrote in the mid 60s, arguably his, ma his masterpiece, certainly on the Philip K. Dick Rushmore which is the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. Yep. The, the relevant word here in this vision is uh, Gnosticism. That's, yes. that's the thing that comes up a lot with mm -hmm. him. And that's mm -hmm. one of the early signs of this. Um, three stigmata. And uh, it's actually been a long time since I read this one, but it's, it's, it's one that lodges in your brain. You know, it's been like probably at least 12 years since I read it. So I know Brad that you actually read this one recently. So I, you I could fill, I can set this up and maybe, maybe you can fill in some details having a, a kind of fresher in your mind. But um, this is one, like I was saying earlier, uh, where he'll like stack different crazy things on top of each other to create a really strange world. But like, um, so in this world you have like, a Martian colonist, right, who've been sort of exiled onto uh, Mars, which is a very like harsh place. Uh, the Earth itself is like basically melting because it's experiencing such intense uh, global warming. Um, and what uh, the colonists that are on Mars have to do in order to cope with living out there is they have to take this drug called Can D. And this is one of for a man who produced a lot of odd ideas, this is an odd one. Um, but it's one that actually has, I think, some resonance in our contemporary world when you get past kind of the kooky or the quirkiness of it, which is that they, basically that you have people who are playing this, this game called Perky Pat. It's like a game that adults are playing with dolls, right? And they like, they use these, lay, there's, it's like they have like doll houses and this character Perky Pat. Um, the short story, by the way, is he derives this from a short story called The Days of Perky Pat. Worth reading as a companion to this book because it's a, it's a unique story, very good in its own right. And he borrows the Perky Pat idea from this, but this, the Perky Pat story is a different, a different thing. Um, it's kind of about how adults in a post-apocalyptic world are kind of devote, instead of like rebuilding the world, they're sidetracked into like trying to reconstruct a fantasy version of what the world used to be. Um, so anyway, um, so, but in order to, to sort of, uh, per, you know, use the perky pat layout and really get into the game, so to speak, you have to use this hallucinatory drug called candy. And that kind of like brings them into the reality of this. Um, the, the, the title character Palmer Eldritch is basically like this, uh, uh, you know, this titan of industry, this magnate who's uh, before the book's events has like been lost in space. He's like gone to the Proxima system and maybe he was kidnapped by aliens and he comes back like a transformed, like quasi deity, like dark God kind of person. And he has like a mechanical arm. He has the three stigmata are like these mechanical parts of himself that have, that have been replaced. It's actually kind of like the Darth Vader idea before, well before Star Wars. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and we were talking earlier about the subjective worlds idea, how a, a person's reality is like a, a projection of their own uh, psyche. And, you know, the thing with Dick is that, uh, like the goal 
is because like the, uh, being in a, in a subjective world that's just your reality is kind of a purgatorial thing. It's not, it's not really like an amazing thing. Like, oh, I can make the world what I want it to be. Um, I actually think he's very critical of that. Um, the, the ideal is to get what he, to what he calls the koinos cosmos, which is a Greek for common, common world, right? That is shared by everyone. Um, but the worst, the hell reality, right? Worse than just being in your own subjective, being in your own head is being in someone else's head. <laughs> Um, it's being in a world that is subjectively created by somebody else that, it, that you're stuck in. And that wait, actually, wait. Comes- how do you, then how do you explain my, uh, fandom for Joe Rogan and his <laughs> podcast? <laughs> that yeah. guy, I've spent hours in that guy's head. I've spent hours and uh, days in Alex <laughs> Jones. Head. Yeah. Um, this is a relevant reality. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's I, a I, relevant I, idea. Yeah. Well, I guess it's, a, I guess it's a choice. It's a choice. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but yes. well, no. <laughs> so Palmer Eldritch has come back from you know the beyond, and he's come back with a, a rival drug to Candy called Chu Z, which is a much more intense version. It's gonna it's gonna knock Candy out of the market. Um, and then, as I recall, like he's ex- he's like experimentally testing this on some people who he winds up like trapping in these like hell worlds of his own design. Uh, I don't know. Did I get that all yeah, that that's, right? That, pretty yeah, much. That's, that's pretty much what's going on. Yeah, there's always more layers. There's precog stuff, and prefash yep. stuff going on. But yes, generally, yes, you got it. Um, I think yeah, the 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 precog stuff is pretty interesting. I think there's there's another theme, and these are always sub motifs of the the bigger question, the the two main Philip K. Dick questions: What is a human? What is real? The 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 He's, he's usually attacking the what is real with some kind of artificial drug that he's made up. I think there's probably a half a dozen um, mm-hmm. fictional drugs across the across Philip K. Dick's oeuvre, and each one of them has like a different significant effect. Um, Can D and Chu Z are the two interesting ones. The Can D one I, I found to be particularly captivating as a fictional drug because it like it will implant you in the char- the doll characters, but then anybody else you're in the room taking it with is also in that character. And so you're like in the head of Perky Pat or her boyfriend or whatever, who's basically the Ken doll to her Barbie. Um, and then living in this environment and you've got to like agree and negotiate with each other to kind of make this thing happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And the rules are out the window too. You can like have sex with each other and stuff in there because it's not, it's not real. But if you try and bring that out into the Martian commune, then, then you know. Yeah, you have like a sandbox world, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like video game. I mean, it's a little bit of like yeah. video games, right? Like massive, um, massively mul- multiplayer online type games. Yeah, where, We're playing games. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But then Paul, yeah, which is which is all Twitter is. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And but but it does it does have this layered thing where like. So Palmer Eldritch kind of comes out to be this guy that has to be sort of taken down. And, but as you sort of approach him, you kind of realize he's already ensnared you. This is what happens to, um, uh, what's the, there's a sort of two main characters that kind of alternate. Um, Barney Marison, and I'm forgetting the guy who's like Palmer Eldritch's rival and who's secretly a candy supplier. Um, but as you approach, you realize that like Palmer Eldritch has already entangled you in these layered alternate realities and you kind of can't get out of them and one of the main characters chooses to sort of his cell the salvation he gets from palmer eldritch is palmer eldritch is going to allow him to try and replay this moment where he failed a relationship over and over and over again until he gets it right and so to him palmer eldritch is like a salvific figure in a way but it's all artificial it's all happening well, it's not clear where, maybe where is not the right question. Right. Yeah. It's not, but it's, it's not, it's not real, but then it begs the question, of course, well, what is, where would it be real? Was any of it real? You know, I, I will say this book, uh, not really necessarily speaking from experience, just what I've heard that, uh, yeah. this book has some of the best, like the, the, the capturing the feel of a bad trip this book does it very well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then you start, when they start seeing the stigmata everywhere, like as a reader, there's a point where you're reading and you're like, ah, finally we're in based reality. Like there is this moment as you're reading, like, okay, 
all right, all right, let's catch our breath because we just went on this crazy trip. And then this, and then the next character you see has the stigmata, and it's like, oh no, we're <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty well, it's pretty well done. It's a, it is a trip though. This book is of all. I, I know everybody focuses a lot on Ballas being quite sort of psychedelic in a way, and it is, but. Three Stigmata, I think, is actually the most sort of reality disor- disordering of, of all of his books. Yeah, well, v- Valis throws a lot of crazy ideas at you, but it's kind of like, it's almost, I, I kind of call Valis a symposium. Like you have a bunch of characters getting together, discussing very weird things. Um, but st- Three Stigmata is like, it, it really shows it. It's in play. You're, you're actually, like the characters are performing these things. They're stuck, mm-hmm. stuck in these worlds. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Writing as as much as he is here, he can't be a good partner and a good father at all, can he? There's too he's too sucked in. I I don't get the impression that he's working like eight to four and then coming home. I mean, are these are these all nighters? I mean, is that yeah. like yeah. 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 A lot of them. So, I mean, the, the part of the thing after the '50s period, when he was writing all those short stories, it was like nonstop all the time. Once he hits about *Man in the High Castle* and after, the the the, the approach seems to be he will go for a period of time, sometimes months, and not really write anything, and he's sort of gestating. And then what it will do is he will just sit down, and he'll he'll basically just sit down and then get up when the book is done over the course of two, three weeks, a month. And so it's hour, it's 16, 18, 20 hours at a go. And he doesn't stop until it's done. And then he so, crashes and then he, you know, waits six months before he writes something. Uh, you know, I got to ask you, Brad, uh, Kelly, yeah. as a, both yeah. an author yeah. and a psychonaut, yeah. don't you think this extended period of doing what is basically a, like, waking dream Mm -hmm. like it kind of accounts for the the very strange quality of of these books the the kind of weird sort of reality that they that they attain because he's basically just going for so long you know because the thing is like you go when you write if you've ever tried to write you go with a plan right? right at a certain point if you keep going you've exhausted what you've already thought up to do and now you're just yeah. You're just doing, you're just like, now, like the, it's like the subconscious takes over and now you're just like dreaming. Yeah, oh yeah. No, I absolutely think that's the case. And I think in Palmer, you see it in the work after Palmer Eldritch too, but with Palmer Eldritch, there is a moment about 200 pages or 150 pages in where you're like, oh, Dick has lost sight of shore. Like he does, he doesn't like, he's, he's gone now <laughs> and it's still good. It's still compelling. But like, yeah, it's, he has, he, he's, he swam out and now he looks in every direction and he doesn't, there's no way to get home. And I do think these prolonged periods and, and he's clearly on amphetamines, but I think even in addition to amphetamines, he's probably a person who had a superhuman ability for focus and attention already. Like a lot of people did a lot of amphetamines and very few people were writing, you know, respectable novels that front and back while they were doing it. Right. So it's a combination of those two things. Um, But yeah, I think if you keep focusing and you just don't stop, I I think you're, 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 it's one way to get it done. It's one way to get it done, but it's not uh, maybe the most sustainable in terms of living inside the world. It's a tricky thing that I think every writer certainly, yeah, yeah, every writer wrestles with at some point. Well, and this is the thing about Philip K. Dick. We we gave out that bullet list of his issues at the beginning, agoraphobia and neediness and hypochondria. So he would go on these writing vendors and you could not get anything out of him when this was happening, right? And then when he wasn't in them, he was like a child. Like he didn't want to be left alone. Like he couldn't feed himself sometimes, right? So he, he had very, and as a relationship, that would be very difficult to to manage. Like one minute, you, he literally refuses to open the door. And the next minute, he has a panic attack if I leave his side. It's got to be extremely difficult to manage, you know, no matter how much you care about him. Um, and the kids forget about it. I mean... You know. High highs and low lows. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, 
obviously the thing with Anne doesn't work out. Um, he ends up married to this woman, um, Nancy. Uh, Nancy is quite a bit younger than him. I had it written here someplace. We start getting into age gap territory. Um, <laughs> age gap discourse territory. Um, I think darkness Nancy, bingo. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Age gap. Oh, I love oh it. God. <laughs> <laughs> we really are hitting them all here, aren't we? We are. We really are. So she was 21 and he was 36 when they met, which isn't in, you know, it's legal, but it's, it's a lot. You're, um, you're into French territory there. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I don't think it's like unethical by any means, but you know, you're going to get was, looks. I was 36, not that long ago and 21 year olds are children to me. It is a little bit much, you know, it's not out of disrespect to them or anything. It's just, yeah. Um, so right, anyway, you are geriatric. Right. To them. Right. To them. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So now one thing we got to talk about as we get into the sixties. So he meets Nancy. Um, he moves to this place in San Rafael. Um, his mother who's married a new guy, actually they get the down payment for it. And this house is kind of famous. I actually pulled it up on Google maps and just stared at it for a while. Uh, just trying to get into the headspace of, of, of this place in San Rafael. Now, Philip K. Dick, as he's becoming a little bit more famous, Man in the High Castle, right? Three Stigmata, Palmer Eldridge. He is getting uh, sort of co-opted or brought into the kind of the hippie drug thing. He's a little bit of a figure on that scene. Um, a, big, uh, a big reason for this is the science fiction writer Harlan Ellison Ellison brings Philip K. Dick in for a book called Dangerous Visions, which was like this edgy science fiction compilation that came out in 1967, but was also kind of like a watershed movement for like a new wave of science fiction, right? Dangerous Visions. Yeah. What about <laughs> exactly. right, right. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's, That's awesome. It's a, have you, you guys read that? I have not. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's, I, I ordered it, though. I bought it, and it has not showed up yet. You know, it, it, it is a little bit dated in that, like, 60s, like, you know, 1967, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, um, countercultural, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Um, nevertheless, still kind of a class. It's still a classic. It really well, is. The and, list of the list of authors is incredible. Yeah. Like, everybody. J.G. Ballard and Theodore yep. Sturgeon and Larry Niven and Fritz and, Lieber and Harlan Ellison and Philip K. Dick. It's incredible. Dick's story in this is my favorite of his short stories and it's, it's maybe the best in there and maybe his, it's probably his best short story and it, it kind of lives up to the, the title. Um, but I do want to mention that he actually, uh, PKD actually wrote a short story later that was a like parody of the Dangerous Visions called The Story to End All Story for Hall Erlen Ellison's Dangerous yeah. Visions in which it's like a paragraph long and he basically stuffs every kind of like transgressive image that you possibly can into yeah. it. So it's, it's, yeah. that's kind of worth reading too. It's pretty, pretty funny. funny. Yeah. Well, I, the, uh, I, the, I looked this up right. on Wikipedia. Sorry, Brad. I looked this up on Wikipedia right now. The cover is super wild and the, the first edition cover and it says 33 original stories, 33 edited by Harlan Allison and 544 pages of dangerous visions. Yeah. Wow. And, and if you, if you get the book, it's also like, he's gone ridiculous. It's ridiculous in terms of as an editor, there's like five introductions. Each short story has a, an introduction and like an afterword. There's a lot of commentary to it. So yeah. yeah right. Right. Good book, but it's called also kind of like, you know, celebrates it's, itself quite a bit too. Yeah. Well, that's what, I mean, that's Harlan Ellison. Yeah. Right? He was, he was very good at in making, uh, he, Harlan Ellison, very, very talented guy, very good at making it seem like Harlan Ellison was important. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he was, he was very good at that game. Um, one thing that happened in the whole Dangerous Visions thing, part of the intro, um, and this is Harlan Ellison kind of pumping it up, he like implied that Philip K. Dick had done a bunch of acid and had the idea for his story, right? Um, Philip K. Dick later said he just kind of rolled with it. Like it was fashionable to have done a lot of acid in the mid-60s. So he was sort of like, all right, cool. Um, but he claims that he only did acid twice and once it didn't work. So... It's interesting to me that this Dangerous Visions thing, again, Philip K. Dick's a fabulous, so maybe it was a lot more than that. I did listen to him tell two anecdotes about taking acid, in which they sounded like totally different times. So I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I don't believe it personally. I think he took acid more 
than he says. But I also agree that like, you know, his drug was speed. That's what fueled his fiction, not LSD. And he yeah. had like, it's it's almost like the the Salvador Dali. I don't take drugs. I am drugs thing. Mm-hmm. Like he had a weird imagination to begin with. So he, he certainly did. He certainly. Did. Yeah, yeah. He takes yeah. acid and he wakes up the next day and he's applied for a, a real job. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna. <laughs> I just want to go work at the bank. <laughs> we're gonna actually gonna. This is it. That's interesting because we're gonna talk about something like that later. That actually does happen. I hadn't realized that he had won the the Hugo Award for Man in the High Castle. Man in the High Castle, yeah, and he would be nominated for a couple of other times. So he's like he's a serious he's a serious figure at this point in the mid right. mid to late sixties. And this is the thing I had always thought of him as like completely unappreciated in his time until like right at the end. And it's actually not really true. It's sort of the last twenty years of his life. He is a known figure in 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 science fiction and somewhat more broadly in culture in general. So um, now that is helpful if you're trying to get to five wives. Yeah, well, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> I, I believe um, Paul Williams gave three stigmata to John Lennon around uh, the time of the dangerous vision. So if that's kind of like John Lennon was like seen reading Philip K. Dick okay. and that was kind of, that was kind of a big you know, yeah. obviously, if one of the Beatles is reading your books, yeah, like, that's, that's you're going to get some attention. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the uh, yeah, so he married, like I mentioned, he married this woman, uh, Nancy, um, and he got this house that his mother and his stepfather, or his stepfather, had um, had put the down payment on. And this is where the drug stuff gets out of hand. And I think it's partially, it. I think something. He's getting more famous to a certain degree. Um, there's a little bit more money coming in, though. He would basically blow all of it. Um, and his two, his three marriages now have failed. He's with Nancy, who I think is too was too young to to, um, or maybe he just wasn't interested in her. I don't think she could wrangle him. I think the previous marriages had kind of kept his drug use in check to a certain in a certain way. And for whatever reason, the San Rafael house mid to late sixties goes off the deep end and he's got, uh, he's just got random people coming in and out of the house. Teenagers, sometimes sometimes kids that are like middle school aged, um, and you know, se- given drugs away, it became known as a house that if you were like 17 years old and you wanted some speed, you just go to this weird old science fiction writer's house down the street and he'll just give you a bunch of speed for some reason. And you know, maybe he'll talk for a while. And sometimes when you went over there, he was like locked in his bedroom, passed out. Um, and so it was just a revolving door of all of the San Marin County kind of riffraff from runaways to, to you know, kind of dangerous people at times. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, and, and some of this gets weird. Like he gets um, at one point in uh, uh, 1968, I think, or 1969, he's hospitalized um, for some street dope that gave him pancreatitis and kidney failure. So like, you know, it's not, it's not pretty. Even It's a, it's a kind of gross sort of flop house, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it did lead to this experience though, did lead to, uh, the book scanner darkly. So Aldous, what can you tell us about scanner darkly? Oh yeah. So I reread this one recently and I was so pleasantly surprised to find that it holds up as being one of his best books. In my opinion, I think, um, like I was saying, he, he eventually um, kind of synthesizes his, his literary realistic track and his sci-fi track. And he first starts to do this with a scanner darkly because um, I believe his initial draft of this actually tried to do it as a straight, like uh, kind of autobiographical, uh, you know, account of his time uh, of, you know, doing a lot of speed and living with the, with this, with the druggies and, um, and he was influenced by uh, the the publisher Judy Del Rey of Del Rey Books to add in some to make it like in the future, right? So it's set in the '90s, right? Uh, and I, I challenge anyone to read this book right now and imagine that it's set in the '90s. The lingo is pure post like 1970s. <laughs> it's 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 like shag carpets, you know. It's like totally a '70s book, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, um, except there's scramble suits. It's the '70s, yeah, but there's scramble suits. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so yeah, the book is about um, 
a, a guy named Bob Arctor who is a narc, right? He's he's spying on all of his his uh, his peers who are taking drugs, and uh, because one of the things in the, that's in the background of this book is is essentially like a totalitarian government that that Dixie's is emerging in in the seventies in the Nixon era, and we'll probably get more into his his issues with this uh, with the empire and and so on, um, but. Uh, so it's an it's an anti drug war book and it's an anti drug book. It's very good at doing both of those uh, things at the same time. Um, it has some really hilarious dialogue between like just speeded out people. Just some really funny like zany dialogue. Um, but at the same time, it basically deals with the uh, a mental split in the head of this guy Bob Arctor because while he's narking on his friends, he's doing what's called substance D, D for death, right? It's like it's, mm. it's one of his invented drugs that's like most on the nose. Like, yeah, they're literally yeah. taking death, right? Yeah. Um, and as he does this and he's reporting on what is happening, um, and like you said, there's a, there's a thing called a scramble suit, which uh, he allows him to hide his identity from, from the cops that he's reporting to. And uh, it, it's a thing that projects... Uh, uh, just a oh. Oh. an amalgam of faces onto his face, so that people see you and interact with you, and then later when they go to recall your face, it's like that there's nothing there really. So it's kind of a metaphor of their like er- both the multiplication and the erasure of identity that is experienced by people using substance D. And um, what happens to him is he progressively splits his personality between Bob Arctor and. Uh, I forget the, the name he adopts when he's he's narking. And yeah. so what happens is he's literally now spying on himself. And when he's looking over these tapes, he doesn't recognize himself when he sees himself, right? And, uh, you know, Dick was actually interested in the at this time in what's called uh, the bicameral theory of, of the mind, which is that the split between right and left brain. And he had been doing a bunch of research on it. Uh, later, a book came out by Julian Jaynes called The Origins of... Uh, I think the origins of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Uh, I've gotten fascinated with this. So I don't want to get too really? sidetracked. It's a, it's it's too, but I, I recommend people check out the Julian Jaynes book. And then also a recent one that's uh, brought this issue back up by uh, Ian McGilchrist called the master and his emissary. Um, oh, so anyway, incre- that's incredible. I'm sort of reading that in my spare time. now. it's a great book. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. And so PKD was actually like a little bit ahead of this. And he was actually like looking into medical journals. Um, one of his many interests in like, like I was saying, like neurodivergence and different cognitive, you know, uh, uh, aspects of, of reality and subject human subjectivity and consciousness. Um, and so he draws on this literature of split brain research, uh, where you can actually like, you take a person with a severed corpus callosum, you can cover one eye and talk to their left brain or right brain. Right. right? It's weird as hell, but, um, and so, yeah, he has this, he has Bob Archer undergoing a split, um, in his, I mean, the way it plays out in the book, I don't think is realistic based on by it's, it's not like he's really applying it in a, in a literal way, he's applying it more in kind of a, a looser kind of metaphorical way, um, the split brain idea. Um, but if you, uh, if you don't mind indulging me, I'd like to read a short, uh, yeah. short, short ish passage, a scene from a scanner darkly. Cause I think it captures uh, the best of his writing as a, uh, being like both really funny and really depressing at the same time. Um, <clears throat> now let me pull the book out here. Yeah. yeah, for folks who haven't seen it, this is a great film. It's actually one of Robert Downey Jr.'s best roles in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. it's so well cast. Yeah, it is. Not He doesn't play Bob Arthur. He plays, Keanu Reeves plays Bob Arthur, but it's a great role. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Charles Freck, becoming progressively more and more depressed by what was happening to everybody he knew, decided finally to off himself. There was no problem in the circles where he hung out and putting an end to yourself. You just bought into a large quantity of reds and took them with some cheap wine late at night with the phone off the hook so no one would interrupt you. The planning part had to do with the artifacts you wanted, to, wanted found on you by later archaeologists, so they'd know which stratum you came, from which stratum you came and also could piece together where your head had been at the time you did it. He spent several days deciding on the artifacts, much longer than he had spent deciding to kill himself. 
and approximately the same time required to get that many reds. He would be found lying on his back on his bed with a copy of Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, which would prove he had been a misunderstood Superman rejected by the masses and so, in a sense, murdered by their scorn, and an unfinished letter to Exxon protesting the cancellation of his gas credit card. That way, he would indict the system and achieve something by his death over and above what the death itself achieved. Actually, he was not as sure in his mind what the death achieved as what the two artifacts achieved, but anyhow, it all added up. And he began to make ready like an animal sensing its time had come and acting out its instinctive programming laid, by na- laid down by nature when its inevitable end was near. At the last moment, as end time closed in on him, he changed his mind on a decisive issue and decided to drink the reds down with a connoisseur wine instead of Ripple or Thunderbird. So he set off on one last drive over to Trader Joe's, which specialized in fine wines, and bought a bottle of 1971 Mondavi Cabernet Sauvignon, which set him back almost $30 all he had. Back home again, he uncorked the wine, let it breathe, drank a few glasses of it, spent a few minutes contemplating his favorite page of the illustrated picture book of sex, which showed the girl on top, then placed the plastic bag of reds beside his bed, lay down with the Ayn Rand book and unfinished protest letter to Exxon, tried to think of something meaningful, meaningful, but could not, although he kept remembering the girl being on top, and then with a glass of the Cabernet Sauvignon gulped down all the reds at once. After that, the deed being done, he laid back the Ayn Rand book and letter on his chest and waited. However, he had been burned. The capsules were not barbiturates, as represented. They were some kind of kinky psychedelics of a type he had never dropped before, probably a mixture and new on the market. Instead of quietly suffocating, Charles Freck began to hallucinate. Well, he thought philosophically, this is the story of my life, always ripped off. He had to face the fact, considering how many of the capsules he had swallowed, that he was in for some trip. The next thing he knew, A creature from between dimensions was standing beside his bed, looking down at him disapprovingly. The creature had many eyes all over it, ultra-modern, expensive-looking clothing, and rose up 80 feet high. Also, it carried an enormous scroll. You're going to read me my sins, Charles Charles Freck said. The creature nodded and unsealed the scroll. Freck said, lying helpless on his bed, and it's going to take 100,000 hours. Fixing its many compound eyes on him, the creature from between dimensions said, We are no longer in the mundane universe. Lower plane categories of material existence such as space and time no longer apply to you. You have been elevated to the transcendent realm. Your sins will be read to you ceaselessly in shifts throughout eternity. The list will never end. Know your dealer, Charles Freck thought, and wished he could take back the last half hour of his life. A thousand years later, he was still lying there on his bed with the Ayn Rand book and letter to Exxon on his chest, listening to them read his sins to him. They had gotten up to the first grade when he was six years old. 10,000 years later, they had reached the sixth grade, the year he had discovered masturbation. He shut his eyes, but he could still see the multi-eyed, eight-foot-high being with its endless scroll reading on and on. And next, it was saying, Charles Freck thought, at least I got a good wine. (laughs) I'm I'm glad you picked that passage. That's that's one of my favorite passages from this whole... I mean, it's whole. It is hilarious, and but it also is playing on all of the Philip K. Dick tropes. It's kind of bringing them all together. And and when you re- as you read it, like I realized, if I had stumbled upon audio of that and I had not read the book before, I could be convinced that was David Foster Wallace. Actually, um, yeah, it has the same kind of you know, it has its humor in the same places yeah. and the same kind of sardonicism. Yeah. I'm also a little bit reminded of Kurt Vonnegut in his writing mm-hmm. from this period. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that's true. I think he's, and, and he's, he's clearly, he's really come into his own by the time he hit Scanner Darkly. Scanner Darkly came out in 1977. I mean, I, I think he's a fully, we've got a writer in at the peak of his abilities at this point. Yeah, I think he definitely spent more time on this one. Yes. Than he yes. was used to. Yeah, he was yeah. slowing down, for, certainly. And he, I think Scanner Darkly is a, is a really good example of that in particular. Um, I, I, like, I, wanted, I like that book because I think it really encapsulates, too. Now, he, he's really referring to this time that he was in the San Rafael house, which was probably his sort of rock bottom with all these people coming and going. Though the book was written you know, later after he'd been able to kind of got himself out of that situation. Um, but the San Rafael house was, was pretty insane. I mean, at one point... <clears throat> Um, at one point, he called the police and told them, um, I'm a machine, and I'm afraid, I can't remember the exact quote, I had it here, but I've kind of lost it. I'm a machine, and I'm afraid I'm going to uh, 
uh, something was going to happen. I don't remember if it freedom to destroy something. Um, and the police didn't do anything about it. He was a known entity to the, to the San Rafael police as this kind of flop drug house. Um, at one point, his um, files were, his fireproof, 700-pound fireproof um, file folder was, um, he said it was, bl- it was blown open by, like, explosives, and all of his records were stolen. Um, he came up with all kinds of theories about this, including it was uh, black militants from his neighborhood for some reason, um, some kind of right-wing group. Um, it might have been the IRS. Why the IRS would break in and steal your documents? It doesn't really make any sense. Um, local police might have been narcs. Um, you know, he had. Well, and, and this is the thing. There's a, there's a there's a lineage of paranoia in his life, and some of it is kind of legitimate. So we had the thing where the FBI talked to him when he was basically a kid. When he was a boy, he says that before his father, um, his mother and father got divorced, he says his father, who was a World War I veteran and probably had some degree of shell shock, would uh, several times um, in Philip K. Dick's childhood, would shake him awake in the middle of the night, get him into the car and says an earthquake is about to happen that's going to just, that's going to flatten this place. And then they would drive as far as he could get. So his father, maybe, this is what Philip K. Dick said about his father, who knows again if it happened. He, um, Philip K. Dick in 1958 wrote a letter to a Soviet, um, a Soviet mathematician, and the letter was intercepted by the CIA. And Philip K. Dick later found this out that it had been, it had been, did a FOIA request in the late 70s and found out that they had intercepted his letter and that they had a file on him. So he, his paranoia was in part justified and in part not. During Vietnam, he signed a famous Ramparts letter that said, I will not pay taxes. And all these other artists did too until the Vietnam War has ended. The thing was, he was so poor when he signed the letter that he didn't owe any taxes. So, <laughs> so it's really easy to not pay taxes when you don't actually owe any. But so he, that and people say crypto has no utility. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 So, so he's living in this. He's he's sort of in, he's sort of purposely making things happen to make him paranoid, but also sort of inflating these things. The guy who the author of um, the Divine Madness of Philip K. Dick, which is all about not so much, it, it, there's a lot of good biographical material in there. And that, you, um, Aldous, you recommended that to me. And it was a great yeah. read. Um, it's more about the sort of visionary aspects of, of Philip K. Dick's life. The author of that book says that Philip K. Dick clearly just robbed himself and like either forgot or just was telling it, spinning a yarn, you know. But, you know, the funny thing is like that, you know, the idea that he robbed himself, which is the, the opinion of the local police, by the way, right? Yep. Um, was like, he also would consider that too. That's like, that's what one of the theories, like I'm yeah. looking into this seriously. Yeah, right. It might've been me. So like, yeah, yeah right. it was like he, he <laughs> right. literally was like investigating yeah. himself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Suspects, <laughs> FBI, Black Panthers, me? me. Like, yeah, it's on, it's on the list with everything else. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Uh, One of my yeah. favorite things is when he starts accusing um, some a bunch of other writers and critics. I know, I mean, it's you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is reputation damaging. Maybe so. Maybe it's yeah. not that funny, but yeah. you know, he started to say, you know, he th- these are his fans, by the way. Like some right. people started taking an interest in him, and like Frederick Jameson is one, and he was a Marxist, but he started saying they're all Soviet agents. And but my favorite one is his claim that that Stanislaw Lem was not an actual person; he was just a committee oh, right. of, of run by the Soviet Union. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, and th- he great. exchanged letters with the guy. Right. This was a friend of his. <laughs> yeah. So you imagine this paranoid, and well, that's the thing: is the books are becoming the reality, and the reality is becoming the books, and the lines are extremely blurry. Um, and as I think, again, I think the obviously the amphetamines are playing a part in this. I mean, th- this is the thing: when he hits peak amphetamines, he's. I wrote this down someplace. Um, uh. He had a habit in today's dollars of something around, where was it? Something around $2,000 a month in amphetamines was, was his daily Ooh. habit at its peak. Ooh. Um, those, are, uh, those are Manhattan Coke habit numbers. Right, right. It's serious. And a lot of these are not even street drugs. I mean, he's doctor shopping because oh, you could get these prescribed at the time, right? So it's a combination of, of, of you know, various speed you could get from a doctor plus street drugs plus whatever you could get his hands on. Say you want about uh, say what you want about drug addicts. Drug drug addicts are resourceful. 
Yes. They will find a way. Yeah, yeah. Jurassic yeah. Park. Drug oh, no, addicts it, it, find it, a way. It, it's, it's so true. No, it's so <laughs> They true. really do. Yeah. Uh, you, I've known some people where I go, how? A, yeah, again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this week at, again? Yeah. We're call, we're we're calling the guy in the black Mercedes again. <laughs> right. Right. At least at least he delivers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh man. So so this period in the 70s, we could have spent a whole episode on this this spe- this period in the mid, early to mid 70s. Um I think one thing that actually actually ends up breaking him out of it is in 1972 in yeah, 1972, and this he goes up to this Vancouver science fiction convention or conference or whatever, and he's just sort of a guest of honor. It's a little bit of a presage of his 1977 trip to France. He gives some wild speech, um, but he's a bit of a guest of honor, and he gets very lonely because he's not used to being by himself, and he tries to commit suicide in uh, in this hotel in Vancouver. Um, it doesn't work, um, obviously. Um, and then he gets through some friends. He's going to try and stay in Vancouver. He ends up in this, um, this drug rehab facility called Ex Calais, which sounds like a Philip K. Dick character or place, but is apparently a real thing. Um, excuse me. And Ex Calais, he goes in and he, he, the only way, according to him, the only way they'll let him in is if he's a junkie. So he claims he's a heroin addict, even though he's not a heroin addict. And um, to to go into this rehab facility, and it's one of these like semi cult like places where you like work all day, and you're not allowed to talk to anybody one on one. And then every once in a while, you have these like humiliation sessions where you sit in the center of a circle, and everybody yells at you. Just, um, just sounds like grad school. Yeah, yeah. a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it, was called, it was called attack therapy. Attack <laughs> therapy. That's the term. Whoa! I was for. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, I don't know if you've ever heard of. Hmm. It's in a nod. No, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I was going to say it's a good thing that he didn't kill himself in Vancouver because if an American commits suicide in Canada, they reincarnate as a hockey puck. <laughs> little oh, known fact. Little known fact. <laughs> <laughs> Aldous, you were going to say. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody's heard of the uh, the group Synanon, but it was uh, this was a big thing in, in, around this time. Uh, they were it was a, a rehab clinic that basically evolved into a, a cult, actually quite dangerous cult too. Uh, I don't know all the details. But it's a really it's a really weird story. It's very like six, late sixties, nineteen seventies, because it only happened at this time. Like. Yeah. Pat, Patty Hearst level kind of craziness that kind of yeah. it was a very strange thing but yeah they would you know they were they were using cult techniques you know you come in for rehab they use this attack therapy all that attack therapy really is is the breaking down of the ego to re right. to to reattach you and rebuild you as a new as a cult member you know it's the same thing right. it's a tried and true cult method yeah. you know yeah. separate you from other people mm-hmm. um and and i was what i was going to say the reason i was bringing this up is because this does get worked into a scanner darkly too because it, bob, it bob archer winds up in a place that's like this yeah right exactly exactly and curiously it kind of works for philip k dick um after 1972 he has his share of problems and i don't think he um, well, he's no, he's apparently was super high on speed in 1977, and when he did the Met speech. But um, other than that, he's basically off speed after 1972, after this trip to Ex Calais. You know, so uh, maybe there's an argument for attack therapy if you're a you know bottomed out lifelong addict. I don't know, um, uh, but apparently it kind of worked for him. Now the the problem is when he came back, he wasn't on speed, but he was on a bunch of other stuff, mostly of, mostly prescribed by doctors, including Darvan for pain. He'd had a bunch of car accidents and stuff like that. Um, Elevol, Cinequan, oh, Tranxin. Dar- he, was, he was on a benzo diet. Darvan or Darvan? Darvan. I think it's Darvan. Yeah. I think that's he was on a, my, I think that's what killed my father. Oh, it might be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Cause it's not on the market anymore. D-R- yep. D-A-R-V-O-N. Yeah, yeah, Darvon. Yeah, that's propoxyphene. That was the painkiller that killed oh, my father. It's wow. not a very effective painkiller. It. Uh, there were people in the '70s saying this never should have hit the market. They took it off the market in. Well, it, it, I just gotta because I know this is a personal thing, but uh, it, this is such a it was such a terrible combination. It was not very effective. They prescribed a lot of it. If you took it, um, if you took too much of it and or with alcohol, you took it. 
it would just, a certain number of people would just die, would just have, their heart would just stop. Uh, it's awful. They finally removed it uh, from the market in 2005 uh, in the UK and then in the United States. I think it came off the market in 2010 or 2011. Do not trust big pharma. Full no, stop. No, All right. Don't, don't. Yeah. So, and don't so, do heroin. Yeah, never do heroin, kids. So mm -hmm. Philip K. Dick, he's apparently off, more or less off speed. He's now on a cocktail of these other drugs, right? Antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, uh, painkillers, blah, 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 blah. Um, not good for you physically, even though it might help you survive day to day, right? Um, 1972, Nancy has left him. Um, uh, you know, can't deal with this. Basically, her point was she said, full stop, there's just too many drugs there. I can't do this. Um, uh, 1972, Philip K. Dick meets Tessa Busby, um, uh, who's described as a shy, intelligent woman who was 18 years old at the time when Philip K. Dick was 44. Um, she claims she moved in the day they met, um, which may be true. She's still around. Like, you can catch interviews with her and stuff. She's still around. Um, and she's a pretty interesting person. Um, uh, you know, I think she was partially drawn to the fact that he was a person who sort of needed somebody. And, you know, she's 18 years old and he's this older, fairly charismatic, very intelligent guy um, who could be very loving and very charming when he wanted to. Um, in 1973, uh, Tessa gives birth to Phil's son, Christopher. Um, and Phil, I think at this point, you know, he's, he's, he's through the speed thing. He's not living in the drug pad anymore. He's had some success. He's going to have a little bit more ahead of him. Um, he has a, he has a son. I think he saw an opportunity to redeem himself in some ways with, with Chris. I'm just going to give you a quick description. This is from Tessa describing Phil with their son together. Quote, Phil was a model father. He loved his son a great deal, probably more than he loved me. Where Phil and I had been partners in crime, pulling off little pr pranks and practical jokes, I found myself gradually cut out in favor of Christopher. It was wonderf wonderful for me to watch the two of them together. It was okay to be cut out because I enjoyed seeing their relationship blossom. So there was really something there, you know, um, between the two of them. Uh, now, after Chris is born, 1974, I think 1974 is now where we have sort of the third and final iteration of Philip K. Dick. We have Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said, which was uh, maybe not his most successful book, but it did get Hugo and Nebula nominations. And at this time, he's starting to get four-figure resale day uh, deals, uh, reprint deals for books to come out in Europe and in Japan, right? So his back catalog is starting to sell now too. So, so that you know that's incredibly helpful because who knows when a ten thousand dollar check's just going to show up? That's great. Um, now the other big thing that happens in 1974 is the famous two three seventy four. And this is where we're going to get into a little bit of the stuff uh, from your favorite bit of, of Philip K. Dick uh, lore, Kevin. This is the, this is the visions. This is, this is where he, he has, uh, he's had a lifetime of, of reality rending experiences. And now they're coming into full flower in this moment, 2374. Um, uh, people who aren't familiar with this, or even if you are kind of familiar with it, but you haven't seen the Robert Crum Crumb comic. It's really well done. Most of it is Philip K. Dick's own words describing it with, you know, the evocative R. Crumb underground comic style. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from it. Uh, let's see. I think I've got it here. I know we're, we're getting into hour three, but we are getting close to the end here. Um, this so, is, we're heading into hour four. Hour four, sorry. Yes, yes. hour three has yes. ended. <laughs> yes, we are, we are winding down hour three. And of course, if you enjoy what we do, we do, we solicit your support principally via Patreon. Uh, you can visit artofdarkpod.com. There are links. It's very easy to do. The beginning um, tier is just $3 a month. If you're online, if you've made it this far, and you're going to listen to other episodes. Consider it. You get a bonus episode. Every episode we do, we do another 20 or 30 minutes. We call those After Darks. And on this one, remind me again what we're going to talk about, Brad, on the After Dark. It's been, it's been three hours. No, I understood. We're going to go. Um, this experience that Philip K. Dick had led to a writing effort that has been called the exegesis 
we're going to go into that exegesis and pick apart, look at some specific parts and try and figure out, we're going to do an exegesis of the exegesis. Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. I just want to say, as a participant and a listener, the After Dark stuff is really good. So oh, just, good. you know. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, we yeah. like to, they're fun. They're, they're I, yeah, I, I think they're worth it. I think we make them worth it. If you're into the show to begin with, at least. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Uh, so basically, I, gotta, I wanna I flag too. I'm sorry, Brad. I wanna flag oh, too. We, we hit a milestone. We had over 10,000 streams were started on Spotify alone. 25,000 altogether. 25,000 altogether. That's not nothing. That's and awesome platform, yeah. we're, we're very happy with that. And we appreciate people who are listening. We know you're out there. We see you. We're vibing with you. We're sharing uh, a broken reality with you. <laughs> we are, uh, and, and to be, to be, uh, I guess to go one step further, we do love hearing from people and Brad runs a Twitter account at art of dark pod. That's a great way to get at us. If you sign up for Patreon, we'll listen to you even more closely. That's true. That is very true. That's very true. <laughs> anyway, go on Brad. Yeah. Okay. So 1974, he's got his son, Christopher. He has this experience where he has a toothache. He goes to the dentist and he's getting, um, he's waiting to get his pain medication. So now I'm going I'm I'm to read from this. Um, this is Philip K. Dick's words. I was in such pain that I went out to meet the girl when she came. She was wearing a golden fish in profile on a necklace. The sun struck it and it shone and I was dazed by it. For some reason, I was hypnotized by the gleaming golden fish. I forgot my pain, forgot the medication, forgot why the girl was there. I just kept staring at the fish sign. What does that mean? I asked her. The girl touched the glimmering golden fish with her hand and said, this is a sign worn by the early Christians. She then gave me the package of my medication. And that instant, as I stared at the gleaming fish sign and heard her words, I suddenly experienced what I later learned is called anamnesis, a Greek word meaning literally loss of forgetfulness. I remembered who I was and where I was. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, it all came back to me. And not only could I remember it, but I could see it. The girl was a secret Christian, and so was I. We lived in fear of detection by the Romans. We had to communicate in cryptic signs. She had just told me all of this, and it was true. I saw the world as the world of the apostolic Christian times of ancient Rome, when the fish sign was in use. It only lasted a few seconds. I went in and took the pain medication. I was bleeding badly and in great discomfort. And then a month later, it all began to seep through. There wasn't any way I could hold it back. The transformation occurred. And it stayed for a year. I saw the world under the aspect of the Christian apocalypse. It wasn't like an alternate reality. It was like, it was like what I call transtemporal constancy. It was an internal, eternal truth, like Plato's archetypal world, where everything was always here and always now and had been that way and would be that way. But there was some kind of dynamism where it wasn't static. There was some kind of time, but it was a different kind of time, a dream time, where the deeds of the heroes occur some kind of mythological time. Everything assumed a mythological quality. Um, he would, at, under this experience, he would come to function, he claimed, better. Um, he was sort of had this, it's so difficult to explain, he couldn't really explain it because it, it varied so much. But, but there were times in which he would, be, he would be sort of guided by either what he called the AI voice or he would be guided by this person who he thought he was basically sharing a consciousness with. Like he was living now in California and this, this consciousness was living in ancient Roman times and they were both like living the same life sort of, right? Transposed on each other. And sometimes the guiding influence of this, which he also decided at one point was Diana, was the, the, the goddess Diana um, and, and, and other entities, <laughs> would he claimed made better decisions for him would make good business decisions for him for instance and would like clean his room for him right it was actually more functional as a human being than he was which is interesting for someone who's going undergoing a you know a psychotic break which is what i think uh, a skeptic might call this right yeah um, it's it's rare to hear this a positive schizophrenic break from reality story. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the part that makes you go, well, wait, what was, you know, what was happening? I think it was part of what fed it into Philip K. Dick, you know, not totally understanding it. Um, now, uh, 
yeah, he, okay, so continuing to read from this, I didn't want to involve my wife in this. She was a, but she was a witness on one crucial matter. She was there when all that information about our little boy's birth defect was transferred to me. She saw me sitting there listening to the Beatles record on the phonograph. Um, he would have died. He was in intimate peril, his, his son he's talking about. It was just a matter of time, only a matter of time. So I was sitting there listening to Strawberry Fields Forever with my eyes shut when all of a sudden this tremendous light hit me. Literally, in the sense I saw the light, I was blinded. I thought, Jesus Christ, what's happening? I'm blind, my head hurts, can't see nothing. All I can see is pink, a phosphine after image like you see when a flashbulb fires off. All I could see was a pink haze, and the words of the Beatles song got all changed around. So the words of the Beatles song got changed around and told him what was happening with his son. Strawberry fields forever. <laughs> he, uh, this dude MK altered himself. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> so there he goes on. I leaped up. Tess was in the other room changing Christopher. I walked in and said, Tess, he's got a birth defect and it's going to kill him. We've got to get him to a doctor. I was so upset I couldn't even drive. So she called the doctor and said it was an emergency. She came back an hour later and she was absolutely ashen. She said he does have a, a hernia and it is down in the scrotal sack. I've got the name of a surgeon. The doctor says we should have surgery emerge immediately. We took him into the surgeons the next day and scheduled surgery immediately. The doctor said your baby have could, die, could have died at any time. Right. So Philip K. Dick's experience of this is that Vallis the AI voice, Diana, uh, Elijah, somebody told him that his boy was going to die from this thing, and he, he responded to it. Um, he was listening to Strawberry Fields Forever when this happened. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Man, the Beatles, the Beatles tapped into something. Uh, yeah, the yeah. light and the dark, I tell you what. You got yeah. this life-saving moment over here, and then you got – Good old Charlie Manson on the other side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. So, well, you know, if you read um, the novel Radio Free Albemuth, uh, a large part of it has to do with the music uh, industry. It's kind of a, he's dealing with it like a, he, it's a fictionalized version of, of some of these events uh, in a world in which there's like a, you know, literally like a, a tyrannical, you know, fascistic government. And a large portion of it has to do with like the battle over, um, two different opposing good and evil forces trying to like slip subliminal messages into records that are being put out. So, you know, Dick really put a lot of stock into uh, that, that possibility of, uh, of uh, like a supernatural or subliminal communication through, through popular records. Right. 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 Absolutely. As, and, as uh, any great, as any great paranoid would, you know, right. Right. Of course. Of course. Well, um, uh, invasion of what is, um, What's the book with invasion in the title? I'm blanking. Divine invasion. Divine invasion has that too, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, we're not. I'm not going to read the whole experience. It goes on. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the after dark. Um, folks can read this R. Crumb comic. It's freely available. Just search R. Crumb Philip K. Dick. It's it's a few more pages. I mean, a couple of notes to hit though. From this, Philip K. Dick derived what he called this idea of what he called the Black Iron Prison. Um, also, the phrase "the empire never the empire never ended" became very important. His whole thing is like we are still living in the Roman Empire, and, and the Roman Empire isn't even the Roman Empire; it's cosmological. Totally in scope. correct. He's a hundred percent accurate. This <laughs> right? is true. Right. The capital yeah. T true. Yeah. I completely believe this. Yeah. I ascribe yeah. to this. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, his I, you know we're living in some kind of cosmological prison realm, and this is where it lines up with like old Gnostic ideas, and it's not even. Even, it's not even it's barely even different from a lot of Gnostic ideas really um, it's, it's sort of updated for the 70s I suppose in a way but he would see this he claimed he would literally see this like he would see bars on windows and they quote unquote weren't there right he, he to him the structure of the black iron prison was just beneath the surface of, of the, sur uh, the surface that you and I see right um, so it's an intense way to live. Um, and eventually this spirit did leave him and it was a crushing experience. Um, he commits, I think it's in 1976, he tries to commit suicide. Um, and he, it's one of these things that he has multiple explanations for. One is that Tess left him and Tess did seem to leave him, though she claims he told her to leave. The suicide attempt, nonetheless, he says partially it's the, that the spirit left him. 
And it's a kind of a crazy thing. So he took a bunch of pills. I downed them with, I think, some red wine. He slashed his wrists, and then he locked himself in the garage and started the car, all three of them simultaneously in 1976. Oh, he's, he's trying to do the full house, of the suicide yeah. full house. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. are suicide attempts that are cries for help. This does not seem like I, one of yeah, them. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And he, and he survived. It's always important to have a backup plan. <laughs> right, 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 right. Plan B. He survives this thing, which is nuts, right? So for whatever reason, the blood stops. The, he, throws, he throws up the pills and the car stalls and he survives this whole thing. Now, he doesn't survive it clean. I mean, he's hospitalized for a while and it is rough on his system. And it's possible that it even accelerated his ultimate demise. But um, I think he came out of that with a, you know, he's had this insane cosmological vision Gnostic vision about what the con- what constitutes reality. Um, he's been spared from a desperate attempt to commit commit suicide. I think there was a certain aspect of another lease lease on life. Not that he just went skipping around after this. I mean, it's. I don't know that we can ever say Philip K. Dick was like a happy person, you know. Um, but it did, it did, he never attempted to commit suicide again. He never really had drug problems again after 1976. Um, and he spent the majority of the rest of his writing time writing his, probably his greatest books and writing the exegesis. So maybe we'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, Vallis Divine Invasion and Transmigration of Timothy Archer, and then kind of talk about just sort of the last years of Philip K. Dix kind of quickly. Yeah, so this is what's come to be known as uh, the Vallis Trilogy. They, they, it's not a traditional trilogy. They don't overlap much in terms of character. They don't, uh, they're not in the same reality in a, in a sense. Um, but what they are is all fictionalizations of, of these things that have happened to Dick, particularly Vallis, um, which essentially fictionalizes everything that we've just talked about from the 2374 experiences um, to the suicide attempt. Um, and what he does is, you know, I mentioned this interested in the, like splitting personality and uh, Scanner Darkly, and he sort of splits himself up <clears throat> uh, in Vallis where he has a, the, the premise is that it's this character who is Philip Dick uh, who was a science fiction writer talking about his friend, the hapless horse lover fat to speak of his uh, penchant for uh, crazy names. But there's a reason for this is that um, the name Philip is Greek that combines the word Philo and hippo. So it's horse lover, right? Um, and uh, I guess Dick in German is means fat. Um, so um, it's also Philip K. Dick. This is not a spoiler because he tells you this on page three. Right. <laughs> um, he, you know, he starts talking about his crazy friend, Horse Lover Fat. And then, then he says, I am Horse Lover Fat. I am writing this in order to gain distance from my, some objective perspective on this experience. So he has the character who is passionately uh, a believer in the, these visions that he's had and is endlessly ph- philosophizing about them. Um, and this more skeptical kind of sardonic character who is you know the worldly science fiction writer and i believe this is just accurate to how dick was and how he perceived himself you know um and he pulls off this incredible magic trick uh, to me and it's kind of a testament to what you can do with writing uh in Vallis, which is that he tells you right off the bat that uh horse liver fat is me also i guess you would have to you know there's a meta thing here because you also have to understand that Phil Dick in the book is me. Um, that's also a character, but he tells you this, he tells you these two characters are the same people. Right. But then as he, and he, as he goes on, he sort of slips up a couple of times where he's saying, uh, I, I mean, horse lover fat, but then as the book goes on, you have the two characters, you just sort of accept the reality that although they're the same person, they're two different people and you take them as two different characters because that's just how fiction works. And so it's really interesting. Um, and so he goes over the suicide attempt, uh, Horse Over Fat's depression, his terrible relationship with women where he's getting obsessed with women who are, you know, also suicidal and depressed and so on. And um, he has uh, 
his experience in mental institutions and um, his, again, he also works the exegesis into it. Um, and there's long excerpts from uh, the exegesis in here where he details his theories about what happened to him. And he has a group of friends who, you know, he's, like I said, I, I take, think of the book as kind of a symposium because you have, everybody's discussing the nature of reality, the nature of God, and you've got, you know, a guy who says God doesn't exist and he's an asshole. You've got the guy who's a, kind of a more of a trad Catholic kind of guy. Um, you've got horse lover fat, who's more like some kind of crazy hermetic Christian. And this is, this is why this is such a, like a big deal book for me early on. Cause it introduced me to all these arcane subjects like Gnosticism and uh, grail lore and uh, three eyed aliens from the planet Sirius that are detailed by the Dogon tribe in their mythology, just right. all kinds of, all kinds of wild stuff. It's such a fascinating book. And it, uh, I think it gets like this pitch perfect uh, tone in it with the depressing, existentially heavy stuff and some some funny stuff as well um oh there are also uh there's also like uh the film you know the, all the characters think horse lovers fat's crazy until they go see a movie called valis which right. just is fictionalized all of ever all the stuff that uh horse lover was telling them where valis is the satellite that's in the sky that beams information down into people's heads and uh the it the characters in it are based on uh, David Bowie and Brian Eno, by the way, there's yep. a whole, whole other meta element to this too. Um, so yeah, that's, that's volume yeah. one of the Valis trilogy. So my, good. My, my favorite PKD. My yeah. favorite Bowie record uh, is, is also a Brian Eno album, uh, Low. And of course, Brian uh, yeah. Eno, yeah, Low is amazing. Brian that's Eno good. was pretty grumpy that he didn't get co-author, but of course it's Bowie. What are you going to do? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great album. Great yeah. album. And uh, so volume two is, uh, you know, I haven't read this one in a long time, so I don't have a lot to say about the divine invasion. I'll just I say that it's a lesser of the three. It is. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably call it science fantasy. It has to do with like a literal invasion of God uh, uh, and to planet earth. And um, uh, yeah, it's just, that's one I, I'll have to reread to have more, uh, more to say about it. Um, and then the transmigration of Timothy Archer, uh, I read recently for the first time. Um, it's, it's pretty good. I think he does a good job of uh, he he um, he sort of rectifies something that he got a lot of flack for, which is having terrible female characters. Yeah. Um, I actually don't think that his female characters are necessarily terribly written all the time, but they tend to be just unreasonably cruel yeah. uh, women, yeah. just like yeah. the worst yeah. women possible. It's mommy issues. It's mommy issues yeah. all the way through. Yeah, until you get to transmigration. Yeah. yeah, so the 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 protagonist is a woman and her uh Angel Archer and she's kind of like she's dealing with death. She's a uh, the uh she was the daughter-in-law of <clears throat> um Timothy Archer who's a kind of big deal Episcopalian um uh <clears throat> priest and this was based on a real guy who was a friend of dick's uh james pike who actually was like the archbishop uh for california of the episcopal church yeah and who was uh, excommunicated for all kinds of scandals and heresies right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he was from the uh, episcopalian church yeah. yeah oh yeah wow you yeah you got to go hard to get he was, he was out there. By the episcopalians he, yeah yeah <laughs> he died in israel like out in the desert searching for like evidence of jesus of the real christ or something yeah yeah, like it literally in the '60s. That yeah, happened. that yeah. story is such a comedy of errors. They they went out with not enough water. They did everything wrong. Basically, mm -hmm. he wound up dying in the desert. But uh, yeah. yeah, so it's like an attempt of Dick, with uh, of Dick to kind of grapple with uh, with these deaths. I think too. Um, and yeah, it's kind of just kind of Angel Archer, kind of uh, uh, going back over her life and and her husband that has died, and Timothy Archer has recently died in this. Uh, kind of crazy way um, but there's a little bit of suggestions of like supernatural elements too uh that they try which this is real too J james pike had a son who died and he was like trying really hard to get in touch with him via seances yeah. and things like that and uh it's actually another aspect of dick's uh 2374 period because he he actually believed that at certain a certain point um that J James Pike was inhabiting his consciousness and it caused him to alter his personality. He yeah. switched from wine to beer and he was listening to different music and uh, yeah. dressing better. Uh, and so it was, again, it was like another positive influence from the, from the spirits. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. I quite like transmigration of Timothy Archer. I think 
if that had not come out, if that had been written by somebody who didn't have a career as a science fiction writer, I think it would be considered just a mainstream novel. Mm-hmm. I think I think the weight of Philip K. Dick's career behind it makes it science fiction. But uh, it, yeah, I, mean, I think he. He came full circle back to straight literary fiction at the mm-hmm. end. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, by the way, also has a character that's a very good impression of Alan Watts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was particularly, I wish I, I, I meant to look this up before this. I was actually quite affected by that book. I was reading that book and um, uh, Camille Paglia's book on poetry, where she just breaks down like a hundred great poems. Yeah, and Brick Burn. Yes, exactly. And there's a poem in there by a poet that I'd actually never heard of. I'd heard of all the others. I'd never heard of him. And then literally the next day I was reading Transmigration of Timothy Archer and he quotes that poet, not the same poem, but that poet. And it was just a very strange. Uh, was it John Donne? It was John Donne. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about John Donne. I never read a John Donne poem. I maybe had heard the name, but was completely unfamiliar yeah. with John Hol- Donne. Holy Sonnet 14. Uh, it was one of, it was one of PKD's favorite poems as well. Yeah. It's really good. If anyone it wants to, I wish I could quote it. It's one of my favorites too, but go yeah. check it out. Holy Sonnet 14. Yeah. So I had a, like, a, I might go back and read that because I had a, like a weird little, and this was like seven or eight years ago, probably I had quite a weird, strange little experience with that. Let's read Holy Sonnet 14 on the After Dark episode. All I'm right. Sure. I'm into that. Sure. Yeah. Maybe I'll jump in and give it a read. Okay. Yeah. Why not? Why not? All right. Yeah. yeah. So I want to kind of wind this down because we're going long. I, I, I think we've got an idea of who K- PKD is. He does slow down. I mean, he's slowing down as Transmigration Timothy Archer comes out. He does have a one. A mere novel a year, I think he's producing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, he's inching along. Yeah, he's inching along. Also, while writing the exegesis, like four, and a, four hours a night or eight yeah. hours a night or whatever. Um, but uh, he's kind of gotten comfortable with living alone, though he still has like little crushes and things. He goes to France in 1977 and he gives his speech, which uh, is incredible called if you think this world is bad you should see some of the others um he was the guest of honor at the science fiction conference he had a big following in france at this time when he gives this speech he um one there's a couple funny things about it. one is they just expected him to give like a normal science fiction uh this is the state of science fiction or whatever um instead he's basically giving a screed from the exegesis it's it's he's telling you all of these things that he's been trying to figure out about alternate realities and, 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 and orthogonal time and all that, which is kind of mind blowing for people. It turned him into like for a minute in France, it turned him into this like guru figure. One thing that was funny about it though, is he had a speech that he prepared that was not the speech he gave. So he's saying the speech and the French translator is saying an entirely different speech which is just this beautiful irony. Oh, that is so amazing. So That's so full moment. of K. Dick. <laughs> exactly. That, of course. <laughs> exactly, right? Right, so good. Um, so that's 1977. Now, as uh, we get closer to the 80s, um, Tessa, Tessa has left and he's by himself. He does try to get her to remarry. He's got a relationship with a woman who's terminally ill who lives in the next building. And not a sexual relationship. He just needed to have... I think I think towards the end of his life he was less interested in sex and romance and just wanted a companion, a female companion, kind of. Um, and as we hit the '80s, um, Ridley Scott op- uh, options to Android Stream of Electric Sheep. I think, for the sake of time, I don't think we're going to talk about that book that much. I think people are familiar with Blade Runner. Um, but I do want to say a couple things about that production of that movie. One is Philip K. Dick did get to see some of it. He didn't get to see the whole movie, but he did get to see some of the effects. They prepared like a short little, almost like a trailer for him to see. Um, very charmingly, a friend of his convinced him to ask for a limousine to go see it. And they gave him a limousine. So that was like kind of cool for him. But by the end of his life, he was making, in the last few years of his life, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in today's money. Like, he had made it, I would say, um, even though he would not get to see Blade Runner. He would not get to see all the adaptations of his work that would come later. Um, in March 2nd of 1982, um, you know, he's got a book, which is maybe my favorite title of a book called uh, An Owl in Daylight, which is fantastic. Uh, mixed discussions about what it was about. Very, very Phil Dickian. Um, uh, but on March 2nd, 1982, he suffered a stroke, and then he suffered several other small strokes, and then he 
passed away at the age of 53. Um, towards the end of his life. Pretty young. Pretty young. Yeah. yeah. He went hard, man. He went hard. Mm. Now, I want to ask kids. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, but I want to read one last thing. Because towards the end of his life, he kind of got involved. He, his youngest daughter, Laura, came back into his life. And I want to just give you something that Laura said about him. Because um, I want to redeem him slightly. You know, I, I have issues with LPKD for sure. I think, we've, I think we've made those clear. And this is from Laura. He was so funny, an incredible sense of humor, and also so polite. His manners were impeccable. When he walked with women, he walked on the outside, nearest the street. He opened doors for me, helped me pick out clothes, and he was so witty and quick. Half the time when he gave interviews, he was laughing inside at the things he said. People don't seem to know that, though. His apartment was full of Bibles and religious books, encyclopedias and books of science fiction, lots of records, especially Wagnerian opera. It was disordered, cluttered, and dirty. I didn't want to use the bathtub. There was mold and mushrooms in the corners in the shower. It didn't bother him. He was one of the most frightened people I have ever known. He wanted to make people happy. He was brilliant and empathetic, but he was trapped by his fears, crowds, cars, freeways, travel, speaking in front of people. All the times he'd say he would do things and then didn't. Tickets to go places that were never used. I found them while cleaning up his apartment after he died. He said that I could move in with him and attend UCR Irvine instead. I didn't take him seriously about that. I couldn't see him being thrilled by my being there day after day. The distance contributed to our having a good relationship. He did his best. He did very well. I never felt he wasn't a good father. He was just who he was. So, you know, that's Philip K. Dick. Um, hmm. I, don't, I don't have a ton more to say. Aldous, if you've got anything else you want to say about Philip K. Dick... Um, just a real quick anecdote, anecdote about the the Blade Runner. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, and I didn't know that he was making that much money at that yeah. time, which is which is great. Um, yeah, good for him. Know, he, he deserved <laughs> he deserved it. Um, he did turn down an offer to capitalize on Blade Runner by writing a the novelization of the movie, yeah. which would put his own novel that the movie was based on out of print, and he he said no to that because he wanted to bring people to, to the, yeah. his, what he considered his true vision into androids, not just artistic, not just artistically, but philosophically and religiously right. too. So, yeah. yeah, he didn't, he didn't sell it. He would, they were going to give him a lot of money too. I think it was on the order of like four, four yeah. or $500,000 for that so, um, in those days. So, so also the, uh, the, that, that novelization, uh, that, that Blade Runner tie in, uh, which is the, is the first PK to, book that i ever got was that that del rey harrison ford on the cover blade runner big letters yeah. do androids dream of electric sheep in small letters yeah i got um, that too. that prior to that book coming out his best-selling book was his very first book solar lottery which was an ace double where it was packaged with some other book <laughs> so, I mean, he, like oh, yeah. you were saying, he did have some success, but it what didn't necessarily translate into big sales, no. big sales. So, no, it didn't. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just enough to barely get by for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I'm just thinking about all the hours he spent writing. Mm. Oh yeah. 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 Many, many books that he never saw published. Yeah. Yeah. Aldous, Brad. Yeah. Certified banger. Thank you for your work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your service. Thank you for giving us more dick than we could handle. <laughs> uh, had to get a dick joke in had there. Had to get a dick Didn't joke you? in there, man. Yeah. And we are going to... We did so well. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, you're okay. That, that, was a good, that was a good one. That was a good joke. I really, I really think it was. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we're going to come back on the After Dark. We're going to talk about the exegesis. I'm going to read this John Dunn poem. Uh, and... But we have to finish with, with a question, the, the classic closing question. And Brad, I believe you have to, I hate to be, you have to ask me the closing question. Yes, Kevin. What do you think Philip K. Dick would be up to now? Amphetamines. <laughs> I think he would be writing. Yeah. I could see him pulling a Cormac and going directly into screenplays after the success of his film, I like could, of Blade Runner. I, I could, could see, see that. that. Yeah, Vi video games possibly. I could yeah. have seen him like going directly into possibly even like writing explicitly for it if he yeah. was around right now. 
Yeah. Uh, he actually messed yeah. around with writing some treatments for like, uh, uh, I want to say it was Star Trek. Oh, really? uh, and yeah. maybe even Mission Impossible at some point. Like he liked doing that, but it, he never got anywhere with it. Yeah. But yeah, I could see him doing that too. Because he wasn't like a word worshiper guy, right? He was get the thing out there on, pay, on the paper. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're not always clear about the rules for this final question, but it's like, you know, is he a vampire? Does he just live forever, <laughs> I guess? Or is he just is he just still alive? You know, but yeah. whatever, who cares? Uh, you know, if he had lived to see today, I think he would very, very comfortably say, I told you so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so, too. I was right. Yeah, well, it's not real. No, and let's pick yeah. it up on the After Dark. Please go listen to Forest of Symbols, Aldous Asterian. Yes. Uh, what is your Twitter handle, Aldous? It's at Aldous Asterian. If okay. You, and, if you look up Forest of Symbols, you'll probably find it, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we'll link it in the show. Absolutely. All right. Beautiful. I love yeah. it. Uh, we are going to go into the after dark. I don't actually think I'm going to close this out, Brad. I think I'm just going to press stop. We'll take a quick break and then okay. we'll come back to the after dark. Brad, you knocked it out of the park. You hit a, and you know what? And this is how many, this is like eight hours of podcasting in uh, a couple of days. So yeah. and then yeah. we're, we're going to do a Twitter. We're going to do a Twitter spaces too. So patreon.com slash art of dark pod at art of dark pod on Twitter. You know who we are by now. Please uh, support the show. We love hearing from you. And if you can't support monetarily, you can't afford $3 a month, ah, you know, go and uh, give us a five star on Spotify. Give us a five star, a star on iTunes. That does, that does count for something. Subscribe and, on YouTube. Uh, tell a friend. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We love you. <laughs> and, and again, don't do heroin. And also maybe like, don't do don't do too many amphetamines. Yeah. You want to live to be at least like seventy years old, don't you? Yeah, at least. Yeah. At All least right. in this universe, in this material <laughs> realm. Who knows? Maybe we're dead and Philip K. Dick is alive somewhere, uh, <laughs> cashing cash <and> checks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Alvin. Peace out.